Good morning, fellow warriors. I'm an actor who looks a little bit like Jon Snow. Thanks for coming along to today's Brighton SEO. We're expecting over 4,000 of you along today from all of the Seven Kingdoms. If you've never been to Brighton SEO before, we're a little bit different to other digital marketing conferences. For a start, we're recording this intro video because the final series of Game of Thrones is starting. It seemed like an elaborate excuse for Kelvin to buy a replica version of Longclaw, Jon Snow's sword. It might make sense to explain a little bit about the event's backstory. When the event first started out, it was an excuse for a few mates to sneak down the pub at lunchtime to talk about search. There were around two dozen people along to that first event, so we hired somewhere a little bigger. We kept hiring bigger venues until we ended up here, at the Brighton Centre. We keep trying to squeeze more people in because so many of you want to attend. 50% of people that requested a ballot ticket missed out. Turns out, lots of people want to learn more about search marketing. So what can you expect from today's event? In every room, we have put on excellent speakers who really love their topics. We've also got loads of first-time speakers as well, who we're really excited to hear from. Plus a small number of familiar faces that we can't stop ourselves inviting back. Every single one of them has put their heart and their soul into sharing honest and practical advice on how to do search marketing a little better. Some of you will go back to the office with pages of to-do items. Or maybe you'll just get a couple of new ideas to experiment with. Thank you to every speaker. We're really excited to hear what you're going to share with us today. Plus a special thanks to everyone who voted on topics and helped us work out which topics and speakers to put in each room. The sponsors for paying Kelvin's mortgage and letting him hide the Iron Throne for prop in Auditorium 1. And of course a special thanks to you for making it along bright and early this morning. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Morning. How are we doing? All right. So, welcome along to Brighton SEO. Um, my name's Kelvin. I'll be moderating in here today. That's going to fall over, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, hands up. Who's been to Brighton SEO before? Okay, quite a few in here. Um, quite a few won't have been to Brighton SEO before. Um, so, if you have... Bear with me if you haven't. Um, I'll explain a little bit about the format. So this is Auditorium 1. This is the biggest stage. And we've got some really excellent talks on here today. We've got the keynote at the end of the day with John Mueller, where we're going to be asking him lots of questions. Um, but first up, we've got three excellent speakers in this very first session. I'm very excited about them. Um, what I'd like to do, if that's OK, if we could have a very big Auditorium 1 welcome for our very first speaker, Izzy Smith. And she's going to be talking about driving meaningful clicks with enriched SERPs. Big round of applause, everybody. Wow. Hello, everyone, and good morning. I hope you're all not too hungover, um, but feel free to have a sleep. It's all good. Now, I've got a ton of content to get through today, so hopefully, BT, are you ready? Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> It's funny, I always find this joke much funnier than the audience. So today I'm going to be talking a lot about SERP features um, and how you can use those to your advantage. But what exactly are those SERP features when I'm talking about them? So basically, Google will take content, your content, a lot of, a lot of times, um, and then enrich them and use that as a sort of user-optimized way to um, provide meaning um, and to satisfy users' intent on the SERP. So here's an example for cake, which is a very rich result, because Google can't quite figure out what the intent is of the searcher. Are SERP features bad for my SEO? Well, like everything in SEO, it depends. I'd say the last speaker to stand on this stage of Brighton SEO was Rand Fishkin. What an honor that I'm following there. And he gave a pretty sort of terrifying talk about the reality um, of these heavy search features. There's a great um, recap there by Deep Crawl that you should check out if you didn't see it. And basically, Rand's data found that 72% um, of searches on mobile were resulting in no clicks, and 34% on desktop. And a more recent study showed that in the UK and Europe, 
um, 55% of um, mobile searches resulted in no click because of all these heavy SERP features that are satisfying the users directly on the SERPs. Pretty scary, right? But don't worry, it's not all bad. But there are some things that you still need to consider in order to drive traffic uh, and win those clicks in today's SEO world. So in 2019, basically you need to focus and spend effort on enriching those snippets that you have out there and your SERP feature presence to increase your click-through rate. You also need to focus on bringing the right kind of traffic, and that's very important to remember, because yes, you can go out there and target these heavy volume keywords and drive a lot of, of clicks, but if they're not engaging with your site, if they're bouncing back to the SERPs, then that's a sort of, it's not a very valuable visit for you either. Also, avoid time wasting on no-click queries, and that's why RAND's data is so sort of compelling and sort of scary for us, because there's a lot of searches out there that can be satisfied directly on the SERPs. And you should be building up a strong connected entity or entities um, of your brand. And that's why I'm here to help you with today. But let's talk about CTR as a ranking factor, which is a pretty um, hot topic recently. Um, I'm sure a lot of you saw the Ask Me Anything by Gary Ish on Reddit. Um, and someone asked him, okay, lots of people are talking about rank brain and, and um, does it take into consideration things like click-through rate, uh, time on site? And it was quite a nice answer from Gary who said dwell time, CTR, whatever Fishkin's new theory is, those are generally made up crap. Nice response. Uh, and I read this and I thought, hmm, okay, there's a bit of miscommunication, maybe some misunderstanding. And then someone found a Google document saying that when you click a link on Google, Google will consider this when they rank that search result in the future. Okay, what's going on? And then this led to a lot of articles being posted like CTR is a ranking factor or CTR is not a ranking factor. Okay, so who should I listen to? And the answer is listen to yourself, yeah? Listen to me. Even if CTR isn't a ranking factor, you should still be spending your effort and time in improving it. If CTR was a ranking factor, Google definitely wouldn't tell you because it would be heavily manipulated. And it would also be far too unreliable, and I'll go into that later. And it would rely on algorithm trust because even Google can't 100% trust that they made the right decision in ranking those results as well. Also, clicks don't always equal search of satisfaction. What is satisfaction anyway? Is it a short visit? Is it a long visit? Is it a no click? Did someone come onto my site and then refine their query? Um, yes, so that's why CTR is such, a, it's too noisy as a metric to consider for ranking. But basically, your job as an SEO should not stop at you know, ranking for those keywords. Your goal is to bring relevant users to your site and help them find what they're looking for, help them achieve that goal. And when you bear this in mind, rather than CTR as a ranking factor, then you're gonna be fine. So satisfy the user's intent, don't just increase CTR for the sake of it. Yeah. And that's why my talk is called Driving Meaningful Clicks with Enrich SERPs and not just Driving Clicks. So bring the visitors that want to be on your website. So here's a number four ranking for guacamole recipe. And I've chose this because it has a rich result telling me that it's less calories, it's less time to cook, and that's the right one for me. So rather than going onto the page and then bouncing back and having a short visit that's gonna negatively impact my engagement metrics, um, I'm bringing a more relevant session to my site. Also, using Enriched SERP, you can be outrankers to the click as well if you're providing more content that's more useful and more relevant. Also, things like feature snippets that get you to the top result, that's such great brand awareness for you and your company. Now, first of all, there's so much that we can learn from looking directly on the SERPs because Google has so much more data than you and they, they know what people are looking for and we can use that to our advantage. So first of all, let's look at these searcher intents in their purest forms. I'm gonna zip through these because there's quite a few. So transactional, um, so I'm, I'm wanna create, I wanna 
fulfill a specific action. I want to spend some cash money, maybe. And the SERP feature that's going to be shown is usually heavily monetized, like ads and shopping results. But also, you get knowledge, um, knowledge graph results and feature snippets. Answer, I'm looking for a direct response to um, a question, and I need fast data. And these are usually those sort of heavy, rich knowledge cards provided by Google. These are my least favorite, and these are the ones that you should avoid, because if there is no intent to actually click on the page, then you're just going to lose. Research, I'm looking for more information, and that's why you see these feature snippets. It's better than an answer intent, because you know they can't be satisfied with one result. They, they need to learn more about what they're looking for. Local, like maybe I'm looking for a specific service, I'm using geo modifiers, I'm using locations, um, and then we see great local knowledge panels and map packs. Visual, like I want inspiration for something. Um, I'm gonna use image search, and then we get a lot of videos and image packs. Also a lot of how-to keywords trigger things like that. Freshness and news is another intent. I'm looking for topics that are going on right now, and then we see these carousels, these top stories, and brand. So someone's looking for your brand, they want to navigate directly to that. Okay, but hey, Izzy, what do I do with all this information? <laughs> Basically, you need to identify intents based on what Google considers their intent and uh, learn from the search features that they are displaying, um, not just by um, analyzing those keywords, Use that research to optimize your content. Uh, this is great inspiration for you out there. A tip, don't forget to combine intents. Of course, someone might be um, looking for a transactional research um, and things like that. Next point, stop wasting time chasing those no-click queries, the ones that sort of fuel Rand's terrifying data. So pure answer intent like, um, when was Jurassic Park released, for example? Because even though a lot of people are searching for this, there is no chance that you're going to be present in that search feature. And yeah, that's why we see this scary sort of data. So in general, when it comes to your keyword targeting strategies this year, um, just forget those unsustainable, pure answer intent queries. Check if the intent can be directly met on the SERP with this sort of query, and if so, you can also avoid that. It's a waste of time and your resources. Um, the mid and long tail has always been lucrative, but now more than ever, it's worth a, like, a big focus and a big push. Um, and in order to find problems with your CTR, you should also understand how Google and Google Search Console reports this data. So some, something that's quite obvious that people sort of miss out on is that they, they sort of go down and across on the SERPs. So there's number one, there's number two, position three, which is a carousel that's been clustered as position three. Um, and if there are like uh, seven more results on the SERP, then this position up here is going to be tracked as position 11. And now when you're looking at this reporting data, maybe, oh, crap, I'm, uh, I'm ranking number 11. That's, that, what can I do? But it's so prominent to be up there. Um, that's where you want to go. So once you like, know this, you can bear that in mind uh, and really dig into the SERPs and how your results are being uh, displayed. So aim to rank above the fold as a benchmark because pure position ranking data is becoming more and more irrelevant. So aim to get above this when the user first views the SERP. Next tip, um, be present and proud in those local intent SERPs, so those map packs. It's one of the last best prominent organic features. Um, even when I'm not searching with geomodifiers or things like me and me, um, if Google considers that this is a local intent query, they're going to display these map packs. So when I search for beer in Munich, it's showing me pubs, of course. And when I at Six rent a car, when we get into the local pack, it has such a great uh, benefit on our incoming traffic and revenue because we're jumping up from organic and we're getting directly there. We have the social proof because of our reviews. And just for this one URL, uh, it's increased so much in traffic and revenue. Um, so that's really something you should be focusing on as well if you have um, actual locations. But yes, it does require love. So these are the type of um, steps that we stick to at Sixth. So of course, the obvious stuff, claiming your Google My Business listing and having consistent NAP, so name, address, phone number. 
Um, having those enriched profiles with all the content, you can grab like relevant images and useful business descriptions, like where are you located and things like that. Also, if you have a connected deep URL, and make sure that that page is uh, strongly optimized. Also, what's kind of cool that we discovered is that the amount of reviews um, had a good impact on getting into the local pack and the percentage of reviews responded to. So make sure that you're um, also dealing with any negative reviews um, or also just thanking the good ones as well. Also, if you rank for a best plus type queries, um, this is epic because it's got that social proof there and that prominence. And what I mean by this is if someone searches for a best plus a service, um, Google will, will then filter the local pack as four stars and above. Um, and then you're right up there and so, you know, work with your teams on, on really promoting the usage and, and driving of good ratings and reviews to get up there. Next step, structured data is your friend some of the time. Um, and structured data basically provides, you know, this great machine readable context and meaning to all the, the wonderful data you have on your website. So as a human, we know what's going on with this data about this game Fallout 3. And also, we know the connections going on there, and there's a lot of way, different ways of connecting um, entity data, especially with the beautiful knowledge graph out there. But in order to make it fully um, understandable by search engines, um, they gave us schema.org. And that's how it's looking um, in its beautiful format to provide that classification to search engines that they can work with. It also helps us build rich results. Now, Kenichi um, is later going to talk about how you can drive more um, rich snippets and rich results. But here is just a few examples of what is out there that you can use. Um, at six, we have really nice rich snippets that showed that our position one, and on average, the CTR has um, increased 85% than just plain normal snippets. So it's, it's a really good uplift in driving your traffic. But also, it also, it brings more engaged traffic as well. So what we found was that these people, because they, they were seeing like product um, rich snippets as well, that they, the balance rate went down, um, the time on site was increasing, they were spending more time, and they were converting more. So that's really good, meaningful traffic that you should be aiming to drive. But the problem is structured data also feeds Google's knowledge graph. Um, and this can be quite harmful because the more data you feed to Google, the more that they can use it and uh, display those rich cards, those really enhanced results. So just an example of some uh, knowledge panels out there. So place, um, a thing, like a food thing with nutritional information, and for your company. So they also have data that they like grab from sources like Wikipedia as well. But make sure that you enrich your entities because if Google's gonna steal data, make sure they steal the right data. So owning your entities and making sure that all of your NAP information is correct and that it's aligned across all these different sources. And also using things like a local business organization structured data. And for things like um, entity carousels, which is what I call this thing, if someone's looking for um, a type of service, you want to be in this carousel. And you do that providing, uh, by providing that organization structured data and by enriching your entity. So these are just some quick tips on how you can do that. So uh, Wikipedia listing parity with what's actually going on in your company, claiming your knowledge panels using your Google Search Console um, account as well, social, social profile alignment, um, and yeah. Also, it's quite obvious, but providing a square logo with your actual um, name in the middle just helps you stand out because enterprise there, um, they just look like erp and it's kind of crappy. Next step, target and win feature snippets that have transactional intent. Um, Emily's gonna be talking a lot about feature snippets after me, um, so I'm just gonna zip through, but I think they're pretty sexy. And if you aim for like research feature snippets with that transactional intent, you can really drive traffic to your site that's gonna convert. But making them clickable um, provides additional love. So make sure that you're bulking out your feature snippet list so that you get this like more items tag on there. Use bu buzzwords in the headlines. Um, make sure that um, also getting that image placement there. Here's an example of uh, 
Europe car stealing my uh, image spot. <laughs> um, just make sure your images are compressed and relevant. Um, also, comparison queries are perfect for feature snippets because people are researching with transactional intent in mind. Um, here's another nice CTR curve. Um, so our rich snippet results versus featured snippets. And even though the rich result was better on position one in terms of CTR, um, the featured snippet, of course, drives more CTR um, when it's lower down. So when my, my organic ranking is lower. Um, also, last year at Brighton, I spoke about featured snippets. You can get the slides there if you want to hear more about my case studies from Sixth. Also, you can provide on-page optimizations that really enrich your standard snippets. Let's not forget that a lot of our, of our results also look like this. Um, what we like to do also is work with our PPC teams on driving, on seeing what content they're using in the ad copy that increases CTR as well. So work with them when you build your titles um, and provide your meta descriptions. Nice tip, mobile image thumbnails are really on the rise, so invest now. Um, it's a great way to stand out in mobile. I'm talking about these beautiful things up here. Um, there's a nice little chart here about, from Rank Range of how many um, SERPs in the US have these image thumbnails, and it's 75%, which is crazy, right? So you can really do this now on driving, on getting those um, image thumbnails. So check your queries in Search Console that drive, I say drive a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just realized. Um, check your queries with the highest mobile device impression share. Uh, you can use Google Dev Tools with Google um, SERP to see how they look in mobile, or you can also use your device, uh, whatever's fast. Um, if they look crappy, then sort of enrich that content um, with some nice relevant images that you, you think will enhance how you look in the mobile SERP. Um, also, sometimes Google's taking the open graph image um, for this mobile thumbnail, so make sure that those are relevant and optimized as well. Another tip, HTML tables are epic. I love them for feature snippet, um, for feature snippet optimization and for um, enhancing your classic snippets as well. Um, it's giving you additional two or three lines of SERP real estate, and these days that's so valuable. Um, so in this case, just a basic table on the page has won me a featured snippet and this wonderful structured description below it. Another tip, site links are a great achievable snippet enrichment. So all you need to do to get these um, nice one-line site links on the SERPs is just by providing these jump links on your landing page um, and making sure that they have sort of relevant names as well in the HTML. Also, this is so useful for things like, like uh, long-form content pages um, and those holistic pages as well. Combine all those techniques together, right? So incorporate these strategies, um, these SERP feature-winning techniques into your content briefings and your page templates, and then it's just sort of like a one-step process, and you're going to keep achieving those beautiful enrichments organically. So, too long didn't read. I've run out of time, guys. So I'm just gonna zip through the, the next steps for you. <laughs> you can take a photo, I will be sharing the slides. Um, yeah, so incorporate all of these into your strategies. Um, and in terms of driving CTR, that's how easy it is sometimes. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you, Sam. thanks so much. Ray. Thank you so much for that. This is really, really good. So, yeah, what we will do um, is each of the speakers hopefully will be sharing um, their slides on SlideShare or a blog post or the various other places that they might well do that. What we'll then do is our friends at Site Visibility are going to compile a list of all of those and we'll send them around to you as well. But if you need them urgently, give the, the speaker their Twitter names are displayed here. Give them a little nudge to do it sooner. So, I'm really excited about our next talk as well. So I love presentations when people put them together and there's a bit of a story behind them and an adventure and an experiment. And I think we've got a bit of that all in this presentation. So if we could have a very large round of applause for Emily, please, everybody. When I first started working at Distilled, one of the first tasks that I was assigned was to try and win featured snippets for one of our clients. I was completely new to SEO, so I really thought this was going to be my chance to prove myself. 
And I spent a lot of time reading all the best practice ways that you could win featured snippets. I was watching videos from conferences. And I, my manager thought that he had just given me a very simple task. Really, what he had given me was a quest to become my SEO talk at Brighton, and I would become the featured snippet master at the Silt. That didn't really happen. I actually ended up hating these things. Izzy calls them sexy. I don't agree. And I'm going to talk about that and my journey into hating featured snippets and how I developed a personal vendetta against them. I'm then going to cover some of the existing research out there and some problems that I have with these studies and why this led me to conducting my own study. And then I'm going to present my findings to you at the very end. I'm going to give you some actions that you can take with you on Monday morning to implement some of this research. So first, though, is he already touched on this, but for those of you that don't know, what is a featured snippet? A featured snippet is this little box that appears at the top of a search query on Google when you ask a question. So why do cats love catnip? Apparently, it stimulates their pheromone receptors, and it gives them an overwhelming sense of euphoria and happiness. We can get a bit meta about this as well. We can ask Google, what is a featured snippet? According to Google, a featured snippet is this box that sometimes they put at the top of a search query. It will include an answer to the question that is scraped from the web page, the page title, and a link to that thing. So why do people love these things so much? What's with the craze? Why do people love featured snippets? The obvious answer is that they go right to the top of the search results, so you can get position zero, as some people call it. The other thing is users love them. They answer users' queries very quickly. And also, they increase brand awareness. So knowing all of that, going back to my first attempt at trying to win featured snippets, I, again, took a very best practice approach on this time around, so my process looks something like this. First, I went into Stat, which is my rank tracking tool of choice for this. They have a great SERP features tab that you can use, and I got a list of keywords that my client ranked for that had featured snippets on them. And on the ones that they didn't have featured snippets, I made recommendations for how I thought they could maybe win them. These were things like including the keyword in the heading. So if I wanted to try and win the featured snippet from Pretty Providence here for the query how to build a blanket fort, and I worked at BuzzFeed, I don't, but BuzzFeed ranks number three here, and I'd look at my page and see, oh, we don't have the keyword in this title, so I might change it to something like this. Also, according to best practice for how-to queries, Google prefers those to be in a list format, like here. So how to catch a leprechaun. Wiki currently owns this featured snippet. If I wanted to try and steal this, and I was Martha Stewart, ranking number five, I'd notice that all our content is locked up in the slideshow. So I'd say to my client, uh, maybe you should pull this out, put it in a list, and you might win that featured snippet. One of my other recommendations, a lot of the queries that my client was trying to target were transactional and how much does X cost type queries. So for these, Google prefers a table. So College Board has the featured snippet here for how much is college tuition. It's too much. And on their web page, if you go, you can see they have this nice table. So I said, OK, for these queries, maybe you should put it in a table. I wrap all this up, deliver it to my manager, and I'm convinced this is going to be my masterpiece. Right now, there's probably a couple questions on your mind. First, is this just a talk about winning featured snippets? Because I didn't really sign up for this. No, that's not what this is. I'm telling a story, as Kelvin mentioned, to introduce my research. And the next question you might have is, did any of these tactics even work? I don't know, because about a week later, Google updates and takes the featured snippets away from every single query that I put a recommendation on for. So lesson number one, Google here is the enemy. That's OK, though. About a week later, different client comes to the same manager and asks for the same task. So he comes to me naturally, the budding featured snippet master at the Stilt and asks Emily, are you willing to do this again? And I say, yes, of course. This time I decide I'm going to one-up Google a bit, and I'm going to focus more on my competitors instead. Instead of just following best practice, I'm going to look, what is the current owner doing that maybe we're not doing? So I ask questions like, are they answering the query better than us? Are they satisfying the user intent? What format are they using? Maybe actually they're answering a how-to question with a paragraph, and Google seems to like that here. Or things like, are they using headings when we're not? Are they flagging up that content better than we are? 
I'm taking quite a lot of time with this, so my manager's like, Emily, come on, it's just a feature snippets task. And so I have one more keyword left that I wanna make a recommendation on. And I'm looking, and the only thing that I can see is different is they have a different H1 than us, but similar content. So I use the oldest SEO trick in the book, and I copy and paste that, put it in my recommendation, and tell our client, use this one instead. That is the thing that works. After about 35 hours of trying to win featured snippets, the one lazy little thing that I do wins. At this point, I'm frustrated. I've wasted so much time, and I decide I have a new lesson from this. Featured snippets are bullshit. And there's plenty of reason to think this, right? Izzy touched on some of this. Rand Fishkin talks about this. What's not to like about featured snippets? First, they steal clicks like every other SERP feature out there. There's this study from AHRS. They use their clickstream data for this. And they say, first, feature snippets are reducing click-through rates. So in uh, SERP queries without a featured snippet, about 26% are going to the top ranking URL. This is compared to about 19.8% on a query where there is a featured snippet. Now, if you have the featured snippet and you're ranking number one, great. But a lot of people aren't doing that. The next thing they show you is it's also increasing the number of no-click searches. So about 25.8% of queries without a featured snippet result in no-click compared to 29.8% with a featured snippet. The next thing is that featured snippets create confirmation bias. So when I was about eight years old, I really wanted a bearded dragon, which is a type of lizard. And my parents were trying to tell me this was a bad idea, so I thought I was gonna go on Google if it was a thing that I did when I was eight. And I could ask a question like this, are reptiles good pets? And I'd say, yes, mom and dad, they're great pets. They're docile, they're low maintenance, I should definitely get a bearded dragon. They could ask a similar but differently phrased question to Google, and they could say, are reptiles bad pets? And they'd say, look, Emily, they're, not, they're just like every other pet, you're eight, you're not gonna take care of this, and actually that's exactly what happened. My parents took care of the bearded dragons for me. But the point here is, they're creating confirmation bias, and we can see this across the web. The last thing about featured snippets that I hate is that they're really unsophisticated. So this uh, example that I showed you earlier where I was able to copy and paste the H1 to steal it is one example. Another example, if you haven't picked up already, I'm American, and Mother's Day is actually coming up for us soon. So imagine I wasn't so great at coming up with a query and I asked something like this, what's a Mother's Day message? Uh, for your sister or friend? Right, so this content isn't really being vetted. A bit more of an extreme example of this is I think everyone has a preferred method that they use to try and get rid of hiccups. Mine is to plug my ears and nose at the same time, hold my breath for 10 seconds and hope they go away. Google, have an orgasm, or better yet, get a rectal massage. So at this point I decide I'm gonna set out to prove that these things are overrated. I'm gonna be an SEO thought leader. I'm gonna do my own research and I'm gonna say, you know what, featured snippets aren't so great after all. So the first thing I do is I go and I see what existing research is out there and I see this study from HubSpot that says featured snippets increase their click-through rate by over 114%. Okay. <laughs> Next I see featured snippets increased snippets by 516%. Uh, blog posts on search engine land. But luckily, all of these studies suck. Sorry if anyone that wrote these is in the audience, we can talk afterwards. But uh, the issues that I have with this study, these studies, first they use misleading wording. So in the case of HubSpot, they're using relative instead of absolute increase to report percentages. So click-through rate for high volume keywords increased by over 114%. I can say that I found people that don't eat ice cream have about a 0.1% chance of committing murder. People that do eat ice cream have a 0.2% chance of committing murder. If you eat ice cream, it's 100% more likely that you're gonna commit a murder. So good reporting going on here. There's also misleading headlines. So they make it sound like they want a featured snippet and then their click-through rate went up by 114%. Actually, if you look at this study, they're comparing pages of theirs that have a featured snippet to those that don't, and they're saying in the high volume bracket, they saw about a 20% different in click-through click rate. So this isn't exactly what happened. There's lots of reasons why a page optimized for featured snippets is getting more clicks. Other thing is there is no experiment control. So back to HubSpot, they included low volume search, key, uh, search keywords in their queries 
which are susceptible to click-through rates that are distorted. Four impressions, two clicks, 50% click-through rate. If we go back to the blog post on search engine land, they show you this graph and they say, we had this page, we did lots of changes to it, we do nothing after February, the only difference is we win a featured snippet in June and we saw a 516% increase. One thing to point out is this is, graph is going up before they even win the featured snippet, so you can't just attribute it to that. Next, you have this graph that says their position was actually increasing throughout this whole time period as well. And also, this page never ranked above position four. If you're going from position six to position zero, yes, you're gonna see quite a dramatic increase. The only important thing about this was it meant I was back in business. So I decided I was going to create my own study, and this was my research method. First, my hypothesis was that owning a featured snippet does not improve click-through rates significantly. The way that I set out to prove this was I used data from STAT. I got a range of keywords across different client of ours. I found pages where they had instances of both owning a featured snippet and not, and I reported the base rank of that page. Now, base rank is, not, uh, is where they're ranking without including SERP features, so it's consistent. I combined this with Google Search Console data to get the click-through rate on that day, and I only included queries with impressions greater than 60. I had 3,834 data points by the end of this. Now, I want you to forget everything everyone's told you about featured snippets, because this is what I found. Featured snippets improve click-through rates for every single organic position. So I didn't manage to prove that these things don't work, but I had a very strong bias, so it's good research. We can see this here. So on the x-axis, we have the click-through rate. On the y-axis, we have the organic position. Blue bubbles are when they own the featured snippet. Red bubbles are when they didn't. So blue bubbles always higher than red bubbles for every single organic position. The other thing this graph tells me is that position four and higher were more likely to own them. So we can see this because the blue bubbles are concentrated in this top left-hand corner. And the reason I bring this up is HubSpot also said 18% uh, of their pages ranking in position one owned a featured snippet. This was compared to 28% in position five. And their claim based off this is ranking in the top five results it means backlinks and other authority signals don't matter that much for winning a featured snippet. I didn't find this to be true in my study. Average rank of pages in my study that owned a featured snippet was 2.1. Those without was 3.3. The last thing in this bubble chart, if you're ranking below 10, a lot of people already know this, but you're unlikely to own a featured snippet. Now, another thing I wanted to explore was this claim that they had a 20% increase in their click-through rate by owning a featured snippet. And I did a similar thing, so I took in my study, I did the difference between the pages that had a featured snippet and didn't, and I graphed the average for each position. This is what I saw. So the highest that I saw was in position four, and that was just over 6% improvement in click-through rate. Now that's great, but it's not anywhere near 20%. This is including very high volume keywords across a range of industries. Now if I wanted to filter this down to just one of our clients, which had a uh, the most data that I had, so this is more similar to what the HubSpot study was like. This gets a bit more dramatic. But you can see that in position five, this is where I saw the biggest increase in click-through rate, and that was still only 10%. So these studies are really inflating that gain. But the conclusion remains the same. Featured snippets work. <laughs> so I still hate featured snippets. Going back to Rand's Fishkin's talk, I don't think they're much different from other SERP features, lots of other people, and everyone's really excited about them, and I think it's distracting us from the problem. But they do improve tra it, traffic, and you're all here today to do that. So how are we going to use these, this information to help ourselves and our clients win some featured snippets? Here's some Monday morning actions for you. This is based off my own experience and also sp experience of other colleagues of mine at Distilled. So first thing you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to generate a list of keywords that you rank for that have featured snippets on them. As I mentioned, I use STAT for this. You can also use Moz SEO Monitor. There's plenty of tools that will do this. I would avoid keywords with commercial intent. Izzy referred to this as tra transactional intent, and the reason I say this is, in the first example I talked about, Google updated and took these uh, featured snippets away on these queries, and I found in my study a lot of times these were getting swapped out for Google shopping results, local packs, things like that. I'd also flag where you're ranking higher than the current owner. As I mentioned, if you are ranking higher, you're more likely to be able to win a featured snippet, so that's a good chance that you can steal that one. 
I'd look for low-hanging fruit. So again, I was able to just copy and paste an H1, and I won a featured snippet. Another example from a colleague of mine at the, or a couple colleagues of mine at Distilled, they joined two points together with the word however. Now, what I mean by this is they noticed that the current featured snippet owner was owning it, but Google was bringing two parts of their page together. So they had one side of the argument, apparently Google's caught on to this confirmation bias thing, so they're trying to help fix it. But so they have one argument at the top of the page, a different at the bottom. Google brought that together with an ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. What my colleagues did is they answered the question with the same two arguments, but they said, first argument, however, second, and they were able to steal that feature snippet. So that's something you can look out for. If you have pages that are performing really well and you don't have content on them at the moment, I would add content on that to target featured snippets. Uh, we've seen this again at Distilled, and we've been able to win featured snippets very quickly on these pages, and they've seen upwards of 24% increase in organic sessions from that on estimates. So make sure that you're targeting these things if you have pages that are relevant for them. Last tip that I have for you is to reformat your content into that that matches the uh, current owner. So this is saying like turning paragraph answers into lists, turning tables, uh, how to, the listen to tables, sorry, <laughs> et cetera, that sort of thing. I'll let you, I see people taking pictures, so I also have this on SlideShare, you can get all these after. So I started this talk and I said, I set out to become the featured snippet master at the stilt. And I wanted to do this by proving that they were bullshit and I really failed miserably at that. But I am standing here today on the main stage of Brighton SEO, so I would say I succeeded in that task. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. I really enjoyed that, Emily. Um, thanks very much. So, I'm gonna ask the audience a question, because that's never a bad thing. Um, so, who here has come from outside of the UK today? Hands up. Thanks very much for doing that, especially considering the UK government were trying to make it like so you couldn't leave. Um, I'm always really flattered that people make the journey from anywhere other than Brighton to come to Brighton SEO, so thanks very much for everyone who does that. But I was really impressed recently when we had an attendee come over from Japan and I had a chat with him and he was really knowledgeable and he had some really interesting things to share, so I asked him to come and speak and he's up next. So if we give Kenichi um, a really big welcome, round of applause and welcome him to the stage everybody. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, first thing first, uh, thank you for joining my session. Uh, I'm honored to have you here today. Uh, in this session, I'll talk about structured data. But before diving into this topic, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Kenichi Suzuki. I'm from Japan. Have you ever been to Japan? I will be hosting the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo next year. We welcome you. Um, I'm a Google product expert of the official Webmaster Health Forum. Uh, I work for a company named Faber Company. The company provides a content marketing tool and heat map tool powered by AI. Uh, I've been writing articles on my SEO blog for 13 years. My blog is the most famous SEO blog in Japan. I'm not joking, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's my brief introduction. Now let's get started. My session covers these three topics. First, I'll show you some case studies of rich results generated by structured data. Second, I'll explain the types of structured data for rich results, which are currently available. Third, I'll refer to the hidden benefits you can obtain from structured data. So, how many of you have already implemented structured data? Did any of you get any positive result? I'll show you some successful case studies of rich results. As you probably know, rich results are generated by structured data. First, Rakuten recipe. Rakuten recipe is one of the most popular recipe sites in Japan they implemented structured data for recipe. The results 
while eye-opening. Traffic to all Rakuten recipe pages from Google search soared 2.7 times, and the average session duration was now 1.5 longer than before. As a Japanese techno geek, I'm proud of Rakuten recipe's accomplishments. Next, Job Rapido. Job Rapido is a worldwide job search engine operating in nearly 60 countries. According to Google, the company's overall organic traffic grew by 150%, and they've seen a 270% increase in new user registrations from organic traffic. They also noted a 15% drop in bounce rate. These improvements were due to Google's new job search. Technically, job search is called job posting. Job posting is also called enriched search results because it's more visual and interactive than normal with results. Brainly is a Q&A forum for students. An ex-Googler, Mira Yatagan, is currently engaging a CEO for the site. According to him, the Q&A results achieved 15 to 25 higher click-through rate compared with normal search results. Do you know Google Dataset Search? It was launched last September, although it's still in beta. You can search statistic data such as the world's population or uh, the change in temperature in the UK. You can get your data included in dataset search by adding dataset to structure data on your pages. Thanks to dataset search, the academic site plus doubled the traffic from Google search. As you can see, I've shown four successful case studies. I would not claim you can always achieve such outstanding results just because you implement structured data. But I'm sure you have witnessed the potentials of structured data to enhance your search performance. Google supports various types of structured data for rich results. I'll show you some examples. Articles with structured data can be displayed as top stories in the carousel. You also need AMP to get the articles displayed as top stories in the carousel. Look at the right screenshot. <coughs> Rating with stars has been around since the beginning. It was once called rich snippets, not rich results. If you offer products or services on your site, you can also show price and availability in rich results. I know of a case study where a travel site slightly increased its CTL after adding price in rich results. Rich results for events are helpful to those who are looking for fun activities. Look at the upper right screenshot. Breadcrumbs is also a kind of rich results that are displayed by marking up structured data. Look at the bottom right screenshot. Restaurant list shows multiple restaurants with a large thumbnail in a carousel. Specific structured data is required for restaurant lists. Structured data is also used in image search. <coughs> Pictures with structured data for recipe are given a badge. The badge indicates there's a recipe behind it. Users can now look at attractive photos, attractive photos of real food in image search and retrieve their recipe. 
badges are also given to products. It said more shoppers are drawn to visuals to directly purchase the products. Users no longer use image search just to look at pictures for fun. Image search has now become one of the means for transactions. I'd like to introduce two new results that are currently in the experimental stage. I can guarantee Google will officially roll them out in the future. It's possible that Google may end them as a test. Anyway, let's take a look. The first one is how to. Apparently, Slack is participating in the pilot program for how to read results. This is a search result from how to, create, how to create a slash command. The steps are displayed in the search result. When you tap, when you tap each heading, it expands into more details. The page has schema or how to as structured data. Structured data testing tool reveals it. How to is a superset of recipe. Recipe is applied solely to cooking, such as how to cook fish and chips or how to make tempura. On the other hand, how to covers wider ranges, such as how to fix a flat tire or how to wear a kimono. The second one is FAQ. It may seem similar to Q&A, but there are clear differences between them. With regard to Q&A, multiple questions on a page are not allowed. In other words, you have to use a single question per page. In addition, users must be able to submit answers. Uh, in general, Q&A results are designed for forum type sites such as Reddit and Stack Overflow. In contrast, FAQ, FAQ results can be implemented for content that has multiple questions on the same page. And uh, unlike Q&A, users don't or can't post questions or answers. The site owner creates questions and answers. Uh, for example, typical e-commerce sites has, have an FAQ page where uh, shipping rates and uh, delivery option, return policy, and other Q&As are provided together. FAQ results are designed for that kind of page. Does it make sense? Yes, yes? thank you. <laughs> now you want to see what FAQ results are look like. They look like this. Questions from FAQ are listed under the normal snippet. They are pulled from the same page. They are expandable, such as how to read results. When you tap each question, the answer appears. This FAQ results example was extracted from Santry's website. Uh, Santry is a major food and beverage company from Japan. The company is especially famous for its whiskey and beer. I hear Santry's whiskey named Hibiki and Yamazaki are popular in the UK too. Santry is participating in the pilot program for FAQ results. With regard to FAQ results, schema of FAQ page is required as structured data. Uh, remember, FAQ and uh, how to are still experimental features, so there's no guarantee if or when they will become available. So maybe you're now wondering what structured data Google supports for rich results. How many rich results do you think are currently available? 10? 20? 
study? Well, let's take a look. You can find all the results which Google currently supports at developer's site. I put the shortened URL on the upper right corner. Uh, do not access the page now. Check it after my session, please. You can, you can download my slides later. Is that okay? Nearly 30 results are available at the moment, and the number is expanding. You can also learn how to mark up this structured data from the documents. Now you know what structured data Google supports for results. I assume your next question should be, which structured data is suitable for my site or my page? Google gives you the answer on the help page. If you publish articles on your blog, article structure data is the right choice. If you sell physical products, you'll want to implement structure data for a product and review. On the other hand, breadcrumbs is suitable for any site. You can read the help article from the shortened URL in the center. Well, let me ask you a question. Why do you add structured data on your pages? Your answer is probably because I want to get rich results displayed in my results. You're right. But I would say rich results is not the real benefit you can get from structured data. There are hidden benefits from it other than rich results. What I'm going to tell now is endorsed by Gary Ilyich. Gary is a webmaster trends analyst at Google Zurich, so trust me. I had a lunch with him last November when he visited Japan. He loves my country, and moreover, tsukeme. A tsukeme is a kind of ramen noodles. I asked him about structured data while eating the noodles. <laughs> let's, dive into the, let's dive into the secrets I got from Gary. Google supports all types and properties of schema.org. Rich results are only a small part of the benefits you can obtain from structured data. They are mainly visual benefits. The critical role of structured data is to help Google understand your content better. Eventually, you can get more opportunities for high rankings. Therefore, add as much structured data as possible, even if it's not, if, even if it's not used for rich results. The downside of adding a lot of structured data is that it may slow down your pages. So I recommend adding structured data as long as it's closely related to your business. All right, I'd like to wrap up my session now. Here are key takeaways. Rich results, rich results have the potential to enhance such performance. As I've shown you successful case studies in the early part of this session. Choose wisely which structured data to implement. Find which results that can produce a positive impact. Add as much structured data as possible, and you'll get more opportunities to be visible in the search. Don't hesitate to add structured data, even if it's not used for rich results. All right, this is all for my session. You can download my slides from the link in the center. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the talk. Thank you.
Cheers. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed all three of those sessions. The thing I love about the way that, and thanks you lot for all allowing us to do this, is where we put the talks together into the sessions, we put the votes out, and then we put them on the stages that people are most interested in. That makes me love the stuff we get. Okay, so we've got a short break now. A few things to say. Don't all disappear at once. Um, you can go to the exhibition and you can, of course, see our lovely sponsors, particularly our headline sponsors, Spotify and Conductor, our premium deep crawl, um, SEMrush, Link Research Tools and Pitchbox. There's something else we're doing new that may be interesting. So we're doing it during this break and the mid afternoon
the wound, uh, second best. <laughs> second best, brilliant. I, I love the modesty, that was perfect. Um, and you were talking about I mean, the, the structured data stuff. I'm a, I'm a really big fan of structured data and uh, Martha Van Berkel, mm -hmm. if you know her, is yes. uh, very, and Aaron Bradley, these people. Yes. So I should be talking to you about structured data more. Uh, you gave us lots of really, really good examples of how it can help. Um, I was very interested in the FAQ because there's a difference of opinion. Yes. Uh, Kimberly Krausberg says she would always put Q and A's one page per yes. question and answer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And FAQ is the same thing. No. Uh, Why? So, uh, so in general, uh, so when you use uh, Q and A, you have to use, I say. As I mentioned, a single question mm. on a page, and people need to be yes. able to answer. Brilliant. And uh, so, Q and A is designed for uh, user generated user generated content mm -hmm. like uh, Reddit. So users must uh, users can post questions and post answers. Yeah. Uh, but unlike a Q and A, FAQ uh, with regard to FAQ, users don't necessarily have to. Post questions or answers, mm -hmm. rather, uh, so the site owner creates mm -hmm. post questions and answers. Yeah. So, they say, for example, so FAQ page. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in general, uh, in uh, FAQ page, there are lots of lots of questions and answers on the same page. Yeah, yeah that, that was my question because the problem with that is as a user experience, mm -hmm. that isn't very good mm -hmm. because you have a specific question and you need an answer. Would it not be better to have one page? Mm -hmm. Per, mm -hmm. per 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 FAQ, mm -hmm. you've got one one question you have, and you have to go through all the content. Yeah. That's what Kimberly is saying. Uh, Would you agree? I see, I see. Yes, I, it depends. So sorry, I wasn't very clear. Yeah, right now, yeah. I'm getting so confused. You can also uh, make uh, FAQ. Don't have to visit your page. Yeah. So. Uh, the search results, so FAQ results com can complete your uh, search. Mm. So in that sense, uh, FAQ results may decrease your uh, uh, traffic. Okay. Ooh, sorry, I just thought of a counter argument to what I just said. Uh, Cindy Crumb's talking about fraggles. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about those? Fraggle, I don't Fraggle, know. F -R -A -G -L -E -S. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's saying that Google is, is hooking onto headings and paragraphs and being able to name. But uh, is is to Google uh, select the select uh, outstanding case studies? Yeah. Yes. Some sites are uh, and were not able to get results. Mm. Is through. Okay. That's right. But not but, in Japan. But uh, but it's uh, applied to uh, UK or US. It's not like, uh, that, that's oh, not wow. the case in Japan. Oh, 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 that's brilliant. So yes. we have Yahoo is dominant using Google. Yes. And what, what percentage of the market do they have? Do you know? I think uh, nearly, yeah, nearly 99% people are using Google or Yahoo. And it, what's the interface like? Is it very different to uh, the Google? Different. So, okay. uh, Google, I uh, know, Yahoo is using uh, the data provided by Google, but mm. uh, in, uh, uh, but uh, presenting it very differently. When it comes to interface, mm. Yahoo can control. Yeah, sure, control yeah. yeah. And so they, the, the they, you know, it's very different. And they have the knowledge panel, and they have the speech yes. elements. They're just presenting it very yeah, yes. differently. But yes, yes. But, uh, Can you invite me to Japan? I want to come and uh, see sure, so, yeah. Yahoo. <laughs> come anywhere, anytime. And I can come and eat noodles with you, <laughs> and we can have a chat, and then yes. you can tell about me in the speech. Brilliant stuff. What were the name of the noodles? Tsukeme. 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 Tsukeme means uh, dip. Yeah. And so we dip uh, soup, we dip uh, noodles into soup yeah. and eat it. Brilliant. With, no. with your fingers? No. no, with, no, no. With, with... It's too hot. <laughs> That's a good point. That was a very yes. stupid question, wasn't it?
The MailChimp Partner Program has opened new doors for our business. I get exclusive content and resources. That gives me early access to a roadmap of what's to come with MailChimp. With priority support, partner training, and co-marketing opportunities, I'm able to grow my customer base and strengthen my network, which helps me make better decisions for our business and our customers. MailChimp's Partner Program empowers my business, gives me valuable insights, and the tools we need to grow. Hello, how are we doing after the break? All right? Yeah? Okay, so, when we start things at Brighton SEO, we don't always think through that they might become traditions. Um, one of those has been the t-shirt cannon. Who's seen me do the t-shirt cannon before? A couple of you, okay. So, I'm going to try the t-shirt cannon. We've been getting better at it, but let's put it this way, if you're in the balconies, you don't need to worry about this. Um, let's have a go. Remember where you put the t-shirts, it's always a good starting point. If you've got a really full cup of coffee that doesn't have a lid, please sort of hold it. There's no delicate way of doing this. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's seen American Vandal Series 2. Really far. No, I This isn't going to work, by the way. And a cash. Very good, very good. There will be more as the things go on. Maybe they'll go a predictable distance at some stage. So, if you could welcome to the stage our very next speaker, Christoph. You will know him from his orange style and his very interesting talks about link building. Can we have a big welcome to the stage, please? Hello, <coughs> folks, it's great to be here. I'm going to talk about how to improve your rankings with internal link building and no headaches. It's great to be back. <coughs> Who of you thinks that Brighton SEO is an amazing conference and comes here every time? Can I see a show of hands? Oh, I expected a couple more. You, sir. OK, yeah. Yeah, I'm Christoph C. Kemper, um, father of two, founder, author, trainer, data geek, speaker, developer. I've been working in SEO and links for 16 years, uh, actually, accidentally. Uh, I also run a charity conference called LRTCon that donated 43,000 euros this year already. And that's, yes, 43,000 euros and a bit. That's roughly 38,000 pounds for children for an SEO's, SEO's Kinderdorf, uh, a very popular in the german market, and we're still looking for sponsors for 2020 at LRTCon.com. Uh, I'm very proud about this result, obviously. That's why I bring this up first. Um, back to the topic, internal links are often overlooked, and I found this out preparing these slides also on my own websites. The challenges with internal links are a multitude. Challenge number one is combining all these different link scopes. And when I mean, what I mean by different link scopes is that there are actually multiple types of link scopes. Um, external links, everyone knows. You know, when you talk about link building, when you talk about link audit, when you talk about Google Penguin, all these things are external links. Internal links, on the other hand, is what we consider links on dub, 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 mydomain.com. However, links that are on my other subdomains like blog.company.com or even on my friends' websites, very close friends, or maybe my other country TLD domains, we call 
network domains. Those are different scopes by my definition. Looking at all these different scopes and differentiating them and thinking about that there is a difference actually between a link from a subdomain to my main domain compared to just being on the same domain um, is one challenge. Combining all of this uh, in a database, in a system, in an Excel sheet, in an audit, it's like switching from a great flat TV in normal link analysis to 3D vision or, or virtual reality. I had a lot of wows, a lot of this can't be true effects. Um, because usually those external links bring you power and trust to the website. They push the rankings. Whatever you hear on some tweets or some people talking about a linkless uh, Google algorithm, the truth is Google is being driven by links external links to your website. If you have a website without links, chances are it probably won't rank well for any competitive terms, whatever you put on it. However, the network subdomain and internal links distributed in there. So all the great links of the world inside going into your website, if those links are not utilized good enough, or if the link power that comes in is not utilized good enough by internal linking, you can also suffer. And those internal links allow you to not only target a lot more keywords with a lot more aggression, if you want, or let's say overemphasis. Of course, we can control our websites. We can go and change our internal link structure like this, like this. Suddenly, 400 links have a new anchor text. Suddenly, 450 links go to another target page. This is totally underutilized by our SEOs in many cases. So we can get more aggressive if we want to. Uh, the learning is I found a lot of those things not being done and yeah, internal links being underutilized, including my own website. You'll see some examples. Uh, linkdetox.com has this problem, just like Brighton SEO, where you see a lot of the links <laughs> internally. And uh, you know, when you look at this, uh, this keyword cloud, you see the blue being the external links for the brand Brighton SEO and the purple ones being the internal links. And very obvious, um, you see code of conduct, terms of condition, privacy pro policy, not being those keywords that Calvin wants to rank for. By the way, sorry for this typo here, Calvin. Um, terms and conditions is not a keyword phrase that you should emphasize on your internal link structure. So for example here, you could just create one page or one category page where these three types of legal documents are combined together. I'm not talking about internal uh, links, uh, no following internal links. I'm talking about the number of links here. The strength of the total link graph here is the strongest one goes to terms and conditions, code of conduct, and privacy policy. Um, link Detox has the same problem, plans and prices. Of course I want people to find my plans and prices, but when you look at other keyword phrases here like link opportunity audit, link detox tune, link detox trainer, who of you knows what link de detox tune does? It's a brand or a sub-brand phrase that is only being searched by people who are already exposed to the brand, who know the brand, while there are other ways to describe what it does. Adapt link building for competitive niches, for example. We'll see that. Challenge number three is actionability and mindset. Of course, we need to do something and change branded phrases or even other keyword phrases, click here, read more, to generic explanatory phrases. This is what I call money phrases or commercial phrases. And you'll see some examples where you say, oh, that's probably too much. We shouldn't overdo this. Let that sink in for a moment because I want to put this into relation to what we see later on. But you can change your internal link structure from very branded, phrase or sub-branded phrases to very commercial generic phrases in a very simple way. Here's a footer navigation on one website, on linkdetox.com actually, where you see all these sub-branded phrases. Just replacing them with something that is natural, more natural language, like understand competitor SEO or speed up Google penalty recovery or review your links fast in a link audit is very different to what we just had before with Link Detox Screener. It just talks. And so a visitor, and this is important, visiting the website would also have an easier navigation. So the overall UX on the website will also improve. 
But these keywords that we have here, the linking keywords, the anchor text that we use, suddenly give those internal links the relevance they need instead of pushing brand names that nobody knows about or that nobody knows yet because they were not exposed to it. Um, going for money keywords throughout the whole site is the objective. And that means to start adding money keywords to all internal links. Where feasible? Where is it feasible? How do we do it? I'll give you another online marketing conference as an example, SEOCom 80 in Austria. This is German, but you will get the point. Uh, you have external in blue SEOCom linked with a brand phrase. You have a lot of other brand phrases linked externally. And internally, you have technical strategy e-commerce. You have very generic categories of what is being spoken about there. I would even advise to maybe add SEOs to, SEO to these keywords, like make those internal linking, say, SEO strategy, e-commerce SEO, technical SEO, because that's what the talks are really about. But what's even more important, they have um, the uh, speaker names here from popular speakers on their landing pages and on their internal link structures. And these are the commercial keywords that they want to rank for. Uh, Calvin does the same here, but he has the talk. He has the talk included in the internal linking. And five years of Google Penguin was popular two years ago when I spoke on this stage, actually. But my name is kind of inflated with that. Looking a little bit deeper, you see there is a variation for my name. Christoph Kemper is available here, so that's not all bad. All I'm saying is that this is to be improved. It can be improved. And it could be a lot worse, like not having the speaker names at all on the internal link structure. Truth is, the conference lives with the speaker. So people would Google for speakers and then eventually find the conference. I'll give you another example from a locksmith site in Austria uh, that has a very, very aggressive internal linking on all money keywords. All of these keywords here are locksmith-related commercial keywords. Everything in purple is just internally. And you see on, the, on, this, on this data table here, we are on page one. All of these are internal links. And only on page number 13, the external links pop up for the brand name called Schlüsselmax. That's uh, the name of the company. Um, with a little bit of money keywords externally. But you see 10 links. It's not overdone. It's, in fact, a one-to-eight relation. Other observations I found on this website is actually not really link-related, but I wanted to bring it up. This is what the homepage looks like, this little cartoon. And down here, the blue bar is the navigation. They are forcing the user, when he hits the website, to actually go below the fold. Everyone hitting that website needs to scroll down. They probably try clicking on this character, but they stay longer on that website. I found that an interesting thing to share. When you scroll down, you see very obvious money keywords linked. It looks like this. If these would be external links, you would call it link spam or overdone, and I would do the same. This is what it looks internally. They link to every district in Vienna by the district number, the district code number. They link to every district by the name of that district. And all the variations, uh, combinations, sorry, all the combinations of district numbers and names and the money keywords again in the footer link. It's really tough. Do you think this looks too spammy? I don't know. For 61 number one rankings, for all these money keywords with very little external links, good, high quality external links, and this on page, I was surprised to find that. And of course, this is just one niche, and the rules are different in every country, in every language, in every industry, even for a keyword cluster, the rules might be different. So be advised, researching your niche is very, very important. Don't take this as a rule of thumb to do this for any client or your, all your websites. I just wanted to bring this up because it's a very, very aggressive internal linking that I found here. 
uh, to make the point uh, that we are missing this, for example. So for instance, on linkresearchtools.com, we have automatically linked all the blog posts. This one here is how to use the Google Disavow links tool, okay. Very good money keyword phrase. Uh, not so good money keyword phrases here. Very, very long. Six reasons this, seven secret SEO tools this that nobody searches for. Where I advise to just rethink the internal linking to your blog and maybe think about adding some custom attributes for uh, one internal link from the footer navigation, another internal link from uh, sidebar navigation or some widgets or, or the, the header navigation. Who says that one blog post only gets one type of link? In general, I would advise you to ask in the next SEO meeting, do you think we're aggressive enough on our internal linking or are we considering this at all to optimize? Some tools that you could use is a free link checker, a browser extension that we built last year uh, for Chrome or Firefox that you can download uh, at this URL or by just Googling link research tools, link checker. Uh, it allows you to do a lot of checking of external, internal, or root domain links on a page, on a single page. You can see how we split all of these up and every click here, every button here I could talk about for another 20 minutes. If you want to uh, learn more about this, uh, just come to our booth uh, right in the front entrance next to our friends at Pitchbox and, uh, or download it and, and check it out for yourself. But it's a combination of two or three other extensions, like our link redirect trace extension is also replacing uh, three or four other extensions. This one is also very, very versatile and comprehensive uh, also for when it comes to exporting the data. Um, WordPress, who of you is using WordPress? Hands up, lots of you. Has tons of extensions and this is one example. Creative Minds has a glossary plugin. Creating a glossary is one thing. Making sure that it gets properly linked from everyone on the website is one key functionality, a basic functionality of such plugins usually. What it does is, when you have some glossary content, for instance, here for the word disavow or disavow file, it looks for occurrences of that word in the content. And then once or twice, or depending on the configuration, replaces that word with a link and a pop-up for users to see that declaration for the definition of the word, but also with a link. So you create automatically one or two relevant links to your glossary or wiki if you want. And this is just one way to do it. Of course, you might argue, oh, I don't want all these internal links to your wiki, but um, we found that to be a very, very good way to educate users in the first place. Educated users are better converting on the actual commercial content on the sales page. And yeah, some of these plugins, including this one, of course, allows you to add multiple internal links. So not all the links go to the glossary page. Um, our new Link Detox Smart also has a lot of functionality for internal links. So some of the screenshots you saw come from it, and we just uh, launched a new entry-level pricing for our um, beta group and plan to launch this uh, to the public in the next two or three months. So there is a good audience uh, in a paid beta. Uh, it's very happy with a new convenient interface and a lot more data and the automated advisory that you saw. By the way, Kelvin, um, looking at your backlinks, we found that measured by link risk, especially that course that was talking about advanced link building here, has a pretty high risk, uh, link risk. And a lot more of those could mean that the overall risk on the website gets too risky, and that could mean a penalty. However, problem links build up over time. You don't need to freak out if you have one or two problem links today. All of these things build up over time and can be tackled over time. And yeah, if soon enough, Calvin can smile again. What I recommend to all of you is to test, to, test, to learn, test, to learn, but also maybe to make mistakes and undo. All of the changes that we do in SEO can be undone. And this is true also for over-optimizations. There is no penalty that doesn't go away. And for the last three years especially, 
a lot of over optimizations can be undone and be fixed within days. Build links, change links externally on, and internally, especially, and just do it. DIFN is my favorite acronym standing for do it freaking now. This is what I suggest some of you maybe do go back to your hotel room and uh, you know, change your footer links. Change them tomorrow or change them next week again. Just consider this being a moving target. And you see Google and users respond to it, but take action to that. Don't overthink. That's, uh, of course, easier in smaller organizations than larger organizations. Uh, to close this, uh, the best links you can get are the ones that your competitors cannot get. I've been saying this for many, many years. And this is my recommendation still today. And you can find them not only by paying an exclusivity fee, you can find them in your network. Remember the four types of link scopes? On your subdomains, on your own site. And also using the Google site command, that's a very common trick or, or method. Or you can use the SERP tool that we had in Link Research Shoes for many years to do one thing. Ask Google which of the pages of this domain are relevant for my keyword, but maybe don't have the links. And then when you resort the whole query by the number of links, you suddenly find out where you want to place the links to those that are so relevant, to push them more. And this is possible with a couple of clicks. And here is an example from our German homepage being, of course, very well linked, but not so relevant for that keyword. Makes sense to have the homepage to link to that subpage. Um, but only take the low risk links. I spoke a little bit about the risk evaluation, which is our core business. And there's a possibility to simulate that risk. A lot of you may not know this. But if we can calculate the risk of a link that's there, if we have the link detox profile, the whole backlink profile, as complete as it gets, we can also simulate the risk of a link before it's there, before you build it. If you have 100 options to get a link from, we can tell you these five will be great for you, these 10 will kill you, and everything in between. Yeah, and that's soon everywhere in link research tools. The slides you get at this link, ask me anything here or at the booth. Thank you very much. This was 20 minutes and zero seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. As I said, yeah, if you weren't in here before, we're going to circulate the slides afterwards. If you want to grab them for, um, to have a chat, please do in the sessions Thank afterwards. So, so there was something I was going to say and I've completely forgot what it was. What was it I was going to say? I can't remember now. Um, anyway, I'm sure it will come flooding back to me. Um, Yes, so we will collate the slides and we will circulate them around afterwards. So, coming up next, uh, we've got Philly. He's a big friend of ours at the conference. He organises one of our... Who here went to training yesterday? A few of you? You should do next time. It's really good. So I quite... I'll tell you a bit of the story of kind of how Brighton SEO and why it operates in the way that we do. Lots of SEO conferences are two days and you get two days of... It you know, quite similar conference talks. Um, we do it a bit differently. We have a day of training. It's, you know, not everyone goes, but it's in-depth on a particular topic. And then we have the conference that allows us to be very broad in scope in what we cover. And Philly does one of our most popular training courses. He is very knowledgeable. Um, but I really liked when he pitched this title to me is like, sometimes when you program SEO conferences and you go to SEO conferences, you get lots of stuff about kind of crazy new stuff that we never talked about before, you know, uh, voice search this and all of that sort of stuff. And, and he was talking about something that's kind of a real fundamental to technical SEO. And I think that's going to be really, really interesting. So we can give him a big round of applause, everybody. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be back here. Um, let's talk about a topic I am extremely passionate about. And yes, that does happen in SEO. I'm a bit of a geek, so I do like the technical details. So let's talk about sitemaps. Yeah, you didn't think that today, right? Boring topic. No, it is actually quite cool. And I'll tell you why. Now, sitemaps, just for anyone who doesn't know, are simple files on your server that basically contain all the URLs of indexable content on your website. Now, these URLs we can find by looking at your database, or we can crawl your website to extract those URLs. 
A lot of people think, well, this manages my crawl budget. Unfortunately, it doesn't. However, what it does do is communicate to search engine what is our prioritize, uh, priorities. What, which URLs do we want to have crawled more, uh, more frequently and more often? Yeah? Which ones are important to us, in a nutshell? It also strengthens our canonical signals, which is actually quite important so we can avoid messages like these. They help us communicate a consistent preferred URL to search engines like Google. Now, I did talk last year about optimizing for search bots, so if you want to check out that talk, this is the URL. Uh, I also do, as Kelvin said, the Brighton SEO Advanced Technical SEO uh, on-page training, so feel free to sign up for September 12th if you want to join me for that one. Coming back to sitemaps, there's a couple of different formats that we can use. One old school one that you may have heard of is the HTML sitemap. Now, I personally do not like the HTML sitemap that much, and I'll explain a little bit why. Other formats, and most used, are the XML sitemap format, which allows us to also use indexes, which is pretty cool. In addition to that, it allows us to add additional information to image uh, sitemaps, news, uh, uh, for, uh, video sitemaps, and news sitemaps. As well as, and this is actually pretty cool, and I'll show you an example why, hreflang, which is actually really, really cool. Another format that uh, a lot of people are not aware of are actually feeds, and most CMS systems support feeds. So they have already a feed uh, available, which means you already have a sitemap. Now, there is a downside with a feed, like RSS or Atom feeds. There is a downside, that is that it mostly contains the latest URLs and not everything. So it's not ideal. Another alternative are plain text sitemaps. Now, I do run into situations where developer teams are refusing, for whatever reason, to uh, program an XML sitemap, but you can convince them to set up a plain text file with one URL per line, because that is basically a valid plain text sitemap. Yeah? Valid sitemap. So, by all means, do that if you can't do XML. It's also quite interesting because in the industry right now, you'll see uh, Bing as well as Google, they're working on indexing APIs. And some people say this will replace the XML sitemaps. Bing is doing a similar thing. Uh, they launched that a few months ago. So I don't think, though, that the indexing APIs will replace sitemaps. Because although we can have indexing APIs communicate which URLs we want to have crawled now, we still can't add the additional metadata like hreflang or news or video, et cetera. So I don't think XML sitemaps are going away anytime soon. And sincerely, I, don't, I really hope they don't because it's way too cool. Um, now, we do want to measure success. And what we can do is we can structure our sitemaps in a way that we can track them separately. So for example, uh, if you have an e-commerce shop, you can have all your product pages in one sitemap and all your category pages in another sitemap and measure it that way. Add those sitemaps then to Google, uh, Google Search Console and see how Google is crawling those particular URLs. Get the stats or get the errors that Google is running into. Yeah? When you then go to Google Search Console, and this is something I really like about the new Google Search Console, is the fact that you can actually filter you can actually filter on all URLs, all the submitted URLs, which is a combination of all your sitemap URLs, or per sitemap. If you haven't checked that out yet, check it out. We can see per sitemap, or as an uh, aggregate across all sitemaps, what the issues are, which wrong URLs are in our sitemaps. But we can also work the other way around and see what is not in our sitemap. So these are URLs that Google has identified as URLs ready to serve to users, while we have not added, added these to our sitemaps. As such, we may not be aware of that these particularly indexable patterns are being served to users and impacting our rankings and user signals and everything else. Now, we can get that sample from Google, but unfortunately, it's just a sample. So we still need to look at our log files and get all the other ones and crawl them. Now, we can use the URL inspection tool to check if each individual URL is indexed or not and submitted or not. Yeah? And that is how we measure the success part.
Now, there are some misconceptions within the industry as well about sitemaps. For one, uh, people say, okay, I put it in a sitemap, now that guarantees it being crawled. No, it doesn't. There's no guarantees. It's a suggestion to search engines. It's not a mandatory rule or guarantee. Same goes for rankings. Sitemaps do not impact rankings at all. Yeah? So forget that part. We don't want to use it as such. There are also limits that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about sitemaps. Sitemaps can only be that big, and we have to split them up in multiple sitemaps at that point. For news, this is actually even a slightly different limit that we're talking about. As you can see, time is actually a major factor for those limits. Any news article that is more than two days old should not be in your news sitemap. We can also add additional fields to XML, uh, but I do run into a lot of resistance with the XML sitemaps, uh, as I mentioned earlier with developer teams, because they obsess about all the fields they need to fill out. The good thing is that most search engines don't care about any of those fields except for the location. Yeah? Which means you can pretty much ignore the other three. So that makes your job a lot easier. And a common mistake I also see is that people include all the URLs of their website, indexable and non-indexable. Now, ideally, a sitemap should only have the canonicals of the indexable URLs. Now, the only exception to that is, is when you're trying to de-index de something and trying to track if that is happening. So in that case, you want to create a separate sitemap with just those patterns that you want to get de-indexed, separating them from your normal sitemaps that should just have the canonicals of the indexable URLs. You also need to keep your sitemap up to date. It's very often that I uh, run into uh, situations where you ask them, okay, when did you last update your sitemap? Well, that was six months ago. Seriously? A website changes in six months. Yeah, so you need to keep that up to date. Ideally, you do this dynamically uh, when needed. Also, be mindful, don't nest indexes. It's, a, it's a, a specification on the sitemaps.org website not to do that. Now, some search engines are smart enough to figure it out, but why leave things to chance? Don't nest indexes. Location matters as well. Where you put your sitemap matters. If you put your sitemap in a subfolder, then all the URLs in that subfolder, uh, all, this, uh, all the URLs in that sitemap should be for that subfolder. Now, uh, the same goes when it comes to different host names. And we can get around that by using the robots.txt. Reference our sitemap in the robots.txt. And we can get around these restrictions. This is according to the official documentation of sitemaps.org. Here's an example of where it goes wrong. This is a Linux, well-known Linux website, gnu.org, where we see a robots.txt on HTTPS. And you can see that the sitemap reference is to HTTP. When we then check that, we get redirected to the HTTPS uh, site map, and then we see again a reference to HTTP. Now, follow that too. Again, we redirect to HTTPS, while all the patterns, including all the hreflang annotations, are on HTTP. So this is a faulty way of making your sitemap. Yeah? These patterns need to be updated. Now, I want to very briefly talk about internal linking. Christoph did a great job talking about internal linking already. So I just want to say one thing, and I'm coming back to my HTML sitemap issue. HTML sitemaps, if you have uh, no other way of improving your internal linking, can be a tool in your tool uh, set to fix some of that. However, it's by far not the best way to go about HTML sitemaps, because HTML sitemaps should not support your internal linking, your internal linking should be your, inter, uh, your HTML sitemap. Every link you put on your website is contributing as an HTML sitemap. Think about that. Every other format, on the other hand, from sitemaps, do not replace actual internal linking. So you still need to do internal linking. Just because you have a URL in your sitemap does not guarantee it actually gets crawled or anything else. It doesn't get link juice, et cetera. You still need to actually place internal links. Now, let's talk very briefly about a couple of situations how sitemaps 
actually solved other SEO issues. So here we had this website that had no canonicals and was using URL, internally URLs with tracking IDs. In the Google search, it looked horrible. Now, this is not what we wanted. Unfortunately, the CMS was pretty uh, not flexible. Like, we couldn't change March. We couldn't add canonicals. That would have solved a lot of the problems. However, custom CMS, not always possible. Luckily, we were able to change uh, the internal linking and remove the tracking ID and replace it with event tracking in Google Analytics. Now, with that, we also added a plain text uh, sitemap. And as a result, we let Google crawl. Some time passed uh, for Google to process everything. And yes, all the URLs in the sitemap, uh, in the SERPs, basically were now without that tracking ID. So it worked, great, this is what we wanted. We were not able to add the canonical, but we were still able to change the URLs in Google SERPs. Another situation that arrives where we, sitemaps really helped us out uh, was improving page speed, especially, uh, specifically for Googlebot. So we had this website which was based here in the UK with servers in the UK to be close to users. Unfortunately, within Google Search Console, we had horrible stats when it came to page speed. So we implemented uh, browser caching to make sure that uh, our responses could be cached for at least six hours to 12 hours. We uh, implemented an edge, a custom uh, edge server. Uh, we put this in the Google Cloud in the US. We also set up a crawler with a cron job. In this case, we use Screaming Frog with command line. So we could basically do a cron job, and on a day-to-day -day basis, multiple, uh, two times a day, three times a day, we could crawl the entire sitemap, which we did. And we did this all within the US, in a Google data center in the US. We crawled, and we cached, by doing so, we cached all the important pages that were in our sitemap that we considered as the important pages for the website, and we cached that locally in the US on our edge server. As a result, our page speed significantly increased, improved for uh, Googlebot, yeah? while we still had our main server in the UK. So again, a solution was made using sitemaps. We were able to do this because of the sitemaps. Another way that sitemaps once uh, solved some issues was with having multiple sites. Now, this is something that I've run into, unfortunately, way too often. Um, where we have multiple websites on multiple domains with servers in multiple countries. <coughs> now, this is a challenge. We wanted to add href lang. The problem was too many stakeholders, too many priorities. They all had different priorities. Yeah? So this was a huge organization with different IT teams in each country, with different servers, and they wouldn't let us edit their websites. We could not add the href lang tags to their content, yeah, to their HTML. What we could do on the other hand was luckily access their database. They did have databases available and we could extract all the canonicals from these databases all, and even filter them by indexable state. We built a sitemap based on that, added the hreflang annotation, put this in a cloud bucket, like in a, uh, in a storage bucket in the cloud, yeah, so on a, on a place elsewhere than any of those servers. We added that bucket also to Google Search Console so we could let Google Search uh, uh, Console know, hey, we are related to that particular bucket and those sites. And we reference every single host name's sitemap because we generated multiple sitemaps, one for each, web, uh, uh, one for each uh, host name. We added these to the robots.txt. So in the end, the only thing that we changed on all those domains was one line in the robots.txt. Everything else, we kept fully under control on our side. We let Google crawl, and yes, we did see positive results when it come, came to hreflang in the Google search results. So again, sitemaps really can be useful. Just a very last quick thing I would like to say, say as well to hopefully open your mind as how we could use sitemaps also. We can use, for example, the command line and look at, hey, how about we download all the sitemaps using command line, using this nice uh, command, and store all the URLs 
we have all the URLs in one go. We can do this ourselves. We don't need crawlers for this. We can do that ourselves. We can do it also with indexes. There's a nice article here that explains everything. Unfortunately, I would have loved to have uh, written this article myself. I have to give credit. Do check out the article. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that we can do, for example, with this is find mismatches. I have seen situations where here, for example, uh, going back to that Linux website, where we have 61,000 patterns estimated. Now, keep in mind, this is just a sample. This is an indicator. This is not uh, the fixed number like, oh, that's it. But it gives us a bit of an idea. Like, OK, how many URLs are there within the Google index on this? Just an idea. Yeah? Then we counted all the URLs in the sitemap, and we only got to 4,500. So 4,500 on one end, 61,000 on the other end. My guess is they're going to have internal SEO issues. They don't even know all the URLs they have. Now, 61,000, even if it's, a, if it's an indicator, is by far out of the ballpark. Yeah? So that tells us that. So again, sitemaps can be used in different ways. And I'm hoping that I opened your eyes to that for the, uh, today. So just a couple of quick takeaways. There are multiple formats. Choose the one that works best for you. Yeah? Ideally, you just have the canonicals of indexable URLs in your sitemap. Keep in mind that sitemaps really strengthen uh, your canonical signals, allows you to add additional information like hreflang, image, news, etc., video. And can, uh, the, uh, sitemaps can solve creatively other SEO problems. They can assist in solving those, but you need to use them. This is why I love sitemaps. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. My name is Philip Wies. I used to work for Google Search. Nowadays, I'm an SEO expert at uh, Search Brothers. You can find me on philly.com as well as searchbrothers.uk. Uh, no, search if you want a copy of the slides, send me a form, uh, send me an email through the form on either website, and I'll send you the slides. Thank you very much. I love that uh, ode to the humble sitemap and what it allows us to do. So coming up next, we've got another really interesting talk around this broad idea of on-site. It's a big old topic, but one that I think all of these fit together quite nicely while taking a quite different approach to what we mean by on-site. This next one's going to be talking about closing content gaps. If we could give a very warm Brighton SEO welcome to Razvan, everybody. Hello, thanks, Calvin, for uh, introducing me. I'm Razvan Gavrilash. I'm the founder of uh, Cognitive SEO. And uh, let me tell you a bit about uh, myself. So I started back in 1997 uh, with the SEO thing. I did it for Alta Vista, Netscape, Lycos, MSN, Bing, Yahoo, and finally, finally Google. Uh, so I've wear many hats during my uh, experience with SEO until now. Today I'm wearing a yellow, uh, yellow tie with some random colorful unicorns, whatever that would mean. And uh, I do love optimization. This was me back five years ago. Uh, I was a bit bigger, 30 kilograms bigger to be more, uh, more exact. And um, I started doing some optimizations in my lifestyle. And I noticed that by doing small things and keeping uh, doing the same small things ever and ever uh, uh, again, I uh, managed to get great results. I think this also applies to SEO. And um, if we keep doing uh, small things in the long term, we will see great, uh, great results. So let's talk about keywords. Uh, and I have this cat which would introduce us into the keywords area. Why the cat? Because if you would search in Google for the query, how can my cat, you will get some interesting suggestions, like how can my cat make money, how can my cat become a model, or how can my cat uh, uh, just disappear. Weird stuff that you wouldn't expect people to, to search, but on a more serious note, if we wouldn't do proper keyword research and content gap analysis, we won't be able to tap into these new traffic sources. So you can get these slides on the uh, Cognitive SEO uh, account. They were just tweeted now. It's a 64 uh, slideshow. Uh, I'm going to start 
uh, with them uh, with a higher pace now, so we can fit them in the, into the 20 minutes uh, uh, space. So the content gap, which I'm going to talk about today, the common knowledge says that your competitors have content that you don't, and that creates the gap. Well, that's the simple way of looking at it. And the more uh, in-depth way and more correct way to look at content gap analysis would be that the content gap analysis process is uh, uh, the process of reviewing and identifying the required opportunities uh, needed to fill the gap between your current state and your desired state. Because your desired state is always higher, you practically can do that by optimizing both your existing content and creating new content. And uh, most of the people, when they talk about content gap analysis, they focus only on creating new content, but they forget that they already rank on lots of keywords and they don't rank as they should uh, be. So that is also creating a gap. So this is what we've been doing at Cognitive SEO for our own site for the past two years, and this is the growth, the search visibility growth that we got, which is more of an exponential way of growing compared to the previous six years uh, from an organic point of view. And this happened when we practically introduced a content optimization tool into our suite, and we were working on that. And uh, what this did practically, allowed us to optimize all of our existing content as well as uh, new content that we uh, would push out in a way that Google would like it uh, more and understand it more. And I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step framework in the following, which will help you do the same. So the content performance metric, which is behind this, uh, this content optimization tool in Cognitive SEO, is a metric that practically helps you assess the uh, quality of a particular document or page to a, to a keyword. And how it does that is uh, uses, it uses very complicated algorithms behind it and it strips the HTML for a page, looks only at the content holistically. It applies natural language uh, processing, semantic analysis, entity extraction, synonym identification, TFIDF analysis. So it's a really complicated process behind that. But in the, for, for the front end user, this uh, doesn't matter and it's simple. It's a simple metric from zero to 100. The higher the metric, the better the page is uh, optimized. And it also gives you suggestions on how to optimize that piece of content by providing you with some uh, recommendations. So, and since we are talking about keywords, we know that not all keywords are created equally. And there are three important metrics that differentiate a keyword. And uh, the first one is the search intent. So the search intent can be informational, transactional, navigational, and the new type of intent, I see it more and more, I call it the quick knowledge one. So the informational one is when you're searching for something that you want to learn. For example, how to do content marketing. The uh, transactional one is when you're trying to do something. So buy a MacBook Air. The navigational one is when you're trying to reach a specific site, Brighton SEO, for example, or Cognitive SEO. And the quick knowledge one is when you're looking to get quick bits of information like time in London now, or uh, car synonym, or car definition. So those Google answer boxes, which in particular areas allow you to do that. The second metric is the keyword links difficulty. And the keyword links difficulty practically assesses how difficult it is to rank on a particular keyword. And that refers only on the links side of things. So the more pages ranking there with more links, it will be more difficult to rank there. The same applies to the content. From a content perspective, um, the higher the keyword content difficulty, which is calculated based on the content performance metric that I told you before, it means that that keyword has more pages with highly optimized content already ranking. So back in 2017, we did a research. We took 40,000 keywords, analyzed 4 million URLs, and uh, tried to understand if there is a correlation between domain performance, page performance, and content performance. 
And we re-ran this analysis one week and a half ago after the Google March update uh, to see how things have changed in these past two years. And the blue line is how it looked back in 2017. The green line is how it looks now for the domain performance or the domain authority. So what's interesting to see is that Based on this research, Google puts less of an interest in the power of the domain for the ranking. It still matters, but it matters a bit less. The page performance, meaning the links that are pointing to the pages matter more, and the content performance even more. So content, met, content optimi uh, optimization matters more, links to the page matter more, and links to the domain still matter, but they matter a bit less. So the framework that I was telling you about, the step-by-step -step process, it's a four-step process. The first step is collecting the keywords. We all have various tools that we use to collect the keywords. Problem is that we generate vast amounts of uh, data and without being able to actually implement on those keywords and without being actually able to extract the correct opportunity. So I'm going to show you three sources that most of you know and have heard of, but maybe they are not using them at their full potential. So the first one is like, it's Google Search Console is, and it's like an iceberg. So you get a lot of data, but most of it is hidden. Maybe it's hidden and it's, it's not used because there is a limitation in Google Search Console on the export of the queries. So you get a thousand limit on the export, but there, is, there are ways to export all of the data. And you have, for example, this uh, free uh, plugin for Chrome, Chrome, a Chrome extension, which is called Search Analytics for Sheets, you install it, and you're able to extract all of the data. I took the Cognitive SEO site and extracted 56,000 keywords that we are ranking on in the past month. And when you extract the data, you get the keyword, you get the CTR, you get the impressions, you get the position, the average position, and the number of cl clicks. Critical data that you have on all of the keywords that you are ranking both high and low. And then you have the Google search suggestions. Remember the cat in the beginning. So imagine that you're inputting 100 keywords to start into the system. You will be able to generate automatically all the combinations, which means tens of thousands of keywords, if not more. So lots and lots of keywords, keywords that already have traffic because Google autocomplete suggests them. And then you have the Google Keyword Planner. Everyone heard about it. But it's a real powerful, powerful tool. And you can get from it uh, suggestions at the query level, at the domain level, and at the page level. But there are limitations here also. And one of the limitations is the search volume. But I'm going to show you how to extract the real search volume in Google, even if you're not spending uh, a dollar in the AdWords interface. So for example, when you paste in uh, the Google Keywords Planner, a list of uh, keywords, you, they will do a forecast. And you can maximize on that forecast by entering a maximum CPC. And when you're entering a maximum CPC, the forecast will be recalculated, and you will be able to see metrics such as the impressions, the clicks, the CTR uh, for all of the keywords in that list. And you can also change the date for the forecast because the default date is uh, the next month, but you can change it for an entire year or for a specific uh, period of, uh, of time. Okay, so adding even more various sources, you can get even more keywords. But let's say you generate hundreds of thousands of keywords. What do you do with that? So the next step would be to deduplicate them, obviously, because you aggregated them from multiple sources. And after you deduplicate them, you can do that in sheets with the unique command. You, can, you need to start crunching the data. And we did this as an example here for uh, this presentation. We used the Cognitive SEO toolset on a project that we're working on, and uh, we took 82,000 keywords for the Cognitive SEO website keywords that we are ranking on also, and new keyword suggestions. And we analyzed about 1,600,000 URLs. So 
I'm going to try to keep it as human as possible in the following because it's starting to get a bit more geeky with charts and stuff. So on all these 80,000 keywords, we did the search intent profiling. So all of the, those free metrics that I told you in the beginning, practically we profiled them large scale for all of the keywords that we analyzed. So the search intent profiling looks like this for the SEO industry and for the keywords that I have researched. So most of the content is informational and then transactional and then navigational. And the links difficulty profiling, which tells me how difficult it would be to rank on these keywords from a links perspective, tell me that most of the keywords are above 25 of, as a score, which means are medium and high difficulty. And the next for the content difficulty, it's the same, medium and high difficulty. Not many low difficulty keywords that I can easily get. But how do I spot these golden ranking opportunities? So it's a two-stage process. The first stage is searching for opportunities in the existing content. And here is the Google Search Console data that I was telling you before. We took 56,000 keywords and we looked at those. And the current ranking distribution for cognitive SEO is like this. It's a it's a ranking distribution that you will see on most of the sites. So most of the sites have rankings. Uh, top rankings which are a few and the majority of the rankings are below number four. So there is a lot of space to re-optimize and get higher position quite easily, you will see in the following. So how do we pick these winner opportunities for this huge amount of data? So we are going to look for the low hanging fruits. And by looking for the low hanging fruits, I applied two filters. A filter that says, I want to look at the keywords that are difficult on a scale from zero to 50 uh, from a links perspective and the same for the content. So after I did this filtering, I got 15,000 keywords, which is way too much again to look on. But remember, we have the Google Search Console data, so we also have some impression data there. And we can apply this volume. And I'm only looking for keywords that have at least some searches, obviously. And I applied this volume of 500 searches per, uh, per month. And then I split them by search intent so I can understand what I need to optimize uh, transactional or informational queries. Okay, so I got 359 winner opportunities narrowed down from 56,000 keywords. The same applies to discovering new ranking opportunities. So the same process of filtering works here also on 26,000 keywords we did this and we extracted 337 quick opportunities. So we have already 700 opportunities that we can work probably for more than a year on uh, this stuff to actually increase the ranking. So now is the step where you are actually implementing the ranking opportunities. So the first one is re-optimization of the existing content. And this is an example with full historical data on how it worked. So for this keyword, technical SEO checklist, it was an article that we published a while ago, and uh, it was re a ranking on an average position of eight or something like that. And uh, after a couple of months, we re-optimized this page. And we took the content performance score in the content assistance tool from 59 up to 95. What this means is that we practically used the suggestions that the tool was giving in terms of keywords on how to write this content so can, Google can understand it better. What happened after we asked for a Google reindexation, which is very important because you can speed up the process for Google to see your new content, is that we moved to position number one, two, and three in a matter of one day. So in the next two weeks, it took, Google practically A-B tested our new changes and it put us on one position one, position two, and position three. After two weeks, it pinned us to the top on uh, position number one and we are still there for quite some time now. So that was about getting uh, an existing content and re-optimizing uh, that to get a higher ranking. So winning a new ranking opportunity, how do we do that? How do we create new content? We need to create content that stands out and it gets more and more harder to do that. 
So first, you need to understand exactly the search intent. And by search intent, I mean you need to put yourself in the shoes of the searcher and think as the searcher does. And when you do that, you will see that things start to change. You will see that you will start to understand the user better. Then you need to assess how difficult it is to rank from a links and content perspective. So how much effort you need to put into actually creating optimized content and how much uh, effort you need to do in acquiring links. Be better, be different. It's broad, but again, if you put yourself in the shoes of the searcher, it will be much more easier because you will see that SERP with the mindset of the searcher. And the final process is obviously to create the content and optimize it. So since we are approaching the Easter, I took this example, Google Easter eggs, which is a keyword that we actually rank on. And I'm going to tell you the story about this ranking. So the Google Easter eggs keyword has about 80,000 searches every month. It's a pretty highly volume keyword. And it has a pretty high uh, content performance, uh, content difficulty, and the high links difficulty. The intent is informational, and people are searching for uh, these Google Easter eggs, a complete list, basically, and the way to see them action in Google. So the process behind it was to create something that stands out. And we created a complete list of Google Easter eggs. It wasn't present, a complete list, as we did it at the time. And we used a title that kind of make, made the user to be more interested in asking himself what's behind this. So the title was the complete Google Easter eggs that will make you go wow. Well. So if we were able to retain the customer after they will see this title in the SERPs, they will take to stand more, thus meaning a high CTR. And we optimized for a high content performance, which was 97, almost the maximum. 100 is the maximum. We used 76 keywords out of the 97 number of keywords that the tool recommended. We published the article. We did nothing more than just hitting the publish button and sharing a few times on Twitter and Facebook. No link building, no outreach, no nothing whatsoever. And this is how the ranking and the organic growth look like for this ranking. So we managed to get, in the first days, position number five on this highly competitive and highly searched keyword. And then, during time, we arrived now at position number three. With us do, without, without us doing anything more prior to the moment of the publication. So a quick recap on what I presented today. We talked about content gap analysis, a more in-depth and correct way on how to do it. The Google Search Console data for re-optimizing on low-hanging fruits that you already rank on. The keyword planner, the keyword suggestions from, from Google, if you get them all together, you, you will have massive amounts of keywords. And then doing a large scale keyword profiling, this is key to the process. So extracting the search intent, the uh, difficulty for the content, and the difficulty for the links. And then filtering and narrowing down those big lists of keywords into a small list of keywords and opportunities. And when you create content, always create for the searcher intent and always optimize for the content performance metric. And repeat, it's a process that you will never end because keywords are almost infinite and opportunities the same. So start filling your content gaps today. You can do this. You need the perseverance and the appropriate tools to be able to, to do that. So these are some of the agencies and brands we work with. I didn't get any chance to say anything about Cognitive SEO. It's a tool which is a power suite of tools which allow you to do almost anything from an SEO perspective, not only the content optimization that I showed you. Uh, if you want to learn more, come out by our booth and we'll uh, discuss on how we can help you grow your rankings. Thank you. Excellent. 
I'm really lucky. Three more talks. I really enjoyed this. So we're now coming to that period during the lunch break. What I want to say as well, hello to the people watching on the live stream at home. Can we all turn around and give a wave to the people on the, the live stream over there? Give them a little wave. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, if you've never been to Brightness here before, we don't provide lunch, um, but we're in a great city for food. We're in a great location for food. Um, there are some recommended restaurants in the app. Um, and yeah, we will see you again after the break. Of course, you could stay on site, grab a sandwich and speak to our sponsors the whole way through. That would make me happy. Um, but yes, have a lovely lunch break and we will see you all very soon. And of course, you can have a photo taken on the Iron Throne if you are so inclined. Thank you very much. We ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. SEO is a yo. Welcome to the show, Raz Van Garvias. Gavrilas. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't nail it. <laughs> I didn't nail it. I had to glance at uh, that yeah, to actually yeah, even get yeah. close. <laughs> You're from Romania? Yeah, exactly. I was hoping to make you work a little bit and ask mm. you to say in Romanian, okay. welcome to the show, Jason. Bine venit la show, Jason. Ah, yes, I love that. I'm happy. Um, I was looking at your websites. You've got okay. two companies, yeah. Cog Cognitive SEO yeah. and a brand mentioning brand thing. Brand mentions, yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. On brand mentions, I noticed that you've put the most expensive on the left and the least expensive on the right. Mm -hmm. Does that work for converting more expensive accounts? Because most people do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. I didn't do an A-B test, but I tested before on Cognitive SEO, and uh, when we had the lower prices, um, people which were buying the cheapest, cheapest, uh, cheapest price oh. uh, had the highest uh, expectations and churned out the more. Ah, the most. okay. So, so the idea is to focus discourage on, them. Yeah, exactly. Oh, encourage you them know. less rather. Encourage uh, the ones who. Uh, would stick more and understand better, and we would serve uh, them better with the, Brilliant. With the product. Brilliant. Uh, that's a little bit similar to Kate Toon, who says, you know, her copywriting with mm -hmm. nothing. Uh, she's trying to get rid of the chaff, the people who are not going to, who are going to churn. Um, that's a really interesting technique to get rid of the people who are going to cause most problems. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I noticed on Cognitive SEO is you put the full price with a little toggle that says, get 30% off by paying yearly. And then you click it and you feel terribly happy to have saved all that money. Does that work? Uh, it works. Yeah, sometimes people uh, come and ask directly for, uh, for the yearly subscription. Oh. But not as much as you would imagine. Ah, so I was imagining. Of the, most of the people are uh, still uh, monthly subscribers. Okay. They don't go and buy directly uh, for, yeah. free, for full year. I, I, for I knew an accountant who told me he always paid monthly, even if it was more expensive because it helps with cash flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you an accountant? No. Ah, okay. There you go. So you won't be able to help me with that. Brilliant stuff. I'm more of a technical guy, so my background is kind of in development. Yeah. Right. You and talk marketing. <laughs> ah, and being a genius. Yeah, and no. <laughs> ah, okay. You can I'm, say I'm yes. Just, I'm just striving. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just working my way, way into the, the process. No, I'm getting the impression you're getting there pretty quickly. Okay, thank We're you. going to talk about user intent, okay. uh, which was a particular area I was interested in because you were talking about uh, no is what, 68%, do is 20%, go is 12%, mm -hmm. and stop doesn't have a percentage. Yeah, but that was on the research that I've done for the cognitive SEO side. So we took 82,000 keywords and we uh, analyzed. Uh, and in this industry, most of the intent is informational. So people are looking for uh, how to oh. do stuff. Then they're looking on uh, searches which are uh, transactional. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, then on the ones which are the brand, uh, brand ones. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we, we have the, the do is actually 20%, which is quite a big number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, that's where you make your money. Mm 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I make my money, or mm-hmm. we make our money. You make your money also on the informational because you re, uh, you educate the the users, and okay. it's a funnel because you bring them into the informational funnel, and then you move them into the transactional funnel, and so on. And if I understand rightly, you educate them not to sign up if they're going to waste your time and be and be churn. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. You, you, you select from them, so some of those uh, that are coming into the informational funnel. Will have will find the value for the information that oh. is that is there, and then they will continue to uh, dig into the into the stuff. And the churners will just go away. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I'm getting a lesson in marketing now. Okay. Um, right. Well, I, I was I was looking for techniques for optimizing for each. I mean, you know, obviously, information you're going to go for the features in a bit. That's my yeah. theory. I just yeah. made up. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead for each each of the three types. Okay, so practically when you're optimizing your content, and we, we are talking about Google now, so the oh. organic rankings in, uh, in Google. When you're optimizing your content, it doesn't matter what type of, uh, any of the types of intent, you need to make Google understand your page better. So yeah. they do all the uh, compl- com- complex algorithms and all, all this stuff in order to understand it better, but we can help it. Mm-hmm. So that's about optimization in the end, to uh, optimize your pages to be understood better and rank better in the in the end. So uh, with the content optimization tool that we have at Contivisio, this is practically what we achieved, to create a, a metric, a system that helps people optimize uh, their their content by providing them with certain suggestions of keywords that they should use okay. and how sh- they should use it. Do, do you give suggestions as to how they should integrate those words into their content grammatically? For example, encouraging sem- semantic triples. We encourage, the there is the Flange Kincaid's course, which yep. is for the readability score. So we also have uh, that metric there when you're writing the content. So mm-hmm. we noticed that uh, when this content is, uh, the, this piece of metric is uh, in good uh, parameters, uh, Google also likes it. So for well, the features that, that you were uh, telling uh, before, uh, most of them have a very good Flange Kincaid score. So okay. Google, it's, it's, uh, it's th- that, that, the metric for for our listeners is practically um, a score that uh, measures how uh, short the sentences are and how easy they are to comprehend. Mm-hmm. So I think that Google practically tries to uh, uh, give the user easy to understand information into the into those features. Yeah. To, to make them happy. Yeah. To give yeah, to give a yeah. clear answer, yeah, whereas yeah. a lot of us write very poetically and we. Mm-hmm. And the, the yeah, semantic triples yeah, yeah, yeah. is they separate the verb, sorry, the the, the entity from mm-hmm, the verb mm-hmm. from the entity, and they're all split across and bringing them together in shorter yeah. sentences yeah, is a very yeah, easy yeah, way. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But this is only part of the part of the stuff. So you need to write obviously to for the user to under to understand mm-hmm. easily. But more than that, you need to um, be creative, obviously. So the tool, no tool replaces the human in the end. So okay. the human is key. You create for the search intent, so you create for yeah. the other person, for the other human who is searching. How do you optimize that content is the technical process, oh. which is not that technical in the end with this tool, because there are some just some recommendation, a simple score, where, which is uh, growing or uh, declining based on what you're uh, doing. And uh, in essence, this when the score is higher, practically it means that uh, uh, you have higher chances in ranking mm. in Google uh, higher. And not only on that keyword, but also on a lot of other entities and synonyms and uh, related related, keywords. related related to that. I, I, like, I like the idea, obviously, machines don't replace humans. Yeah. And Andrea Volpini from WordLift was, yeah, talking, yeah, was talking about yeah. um, the dance between humans and machines, where the humans will help machines to understand better what, what it is we're mm-hmm. trying to do, and it's a dance that we're moving forward. Do you like mm-hmm. that idea? I think we are doing this for quite some time. I think yeah. Google is actually doing doing this. So practically, they are using the humans to train their machines. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, they are doing it with every search that we uh, that we do. With yeah, you should talk to that, uh, talk to Bill Swarovski about yeah, that and his. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I had a podcast with uh, him. Actually. Oh, brilliant! Was that wonderful? 
it was it was it's one of the most uh, viewed ones so from our blog if i recall correctly yeah yeah well he's an yeah. incredibly smart yeah, guy yeah, and incredibly yeah, respected yeah, and doesn't yeah. doesn't talk nonsense yeah he looks exactly it's, uh, into those uh, patterns and all this stuff so yeah, yeah. brilliant guy yeah. okay um now i was wondering i mean about segmentation in terms of moving forward with working saying like, here's a chunk of work here's a chunk of work here's a chunk of work segmenting according to no do go is that a good way to segment your content in order to work on it? It's yeah, yeah. It's a it's a good way to segment it because you can focus your efforts on the funnel. So how mm. much you want you want to educate, how much you want to to sell and focus on selling. Normally, it's easier to get rankings on informational content. Mm. Uh, a bit harder to get on transactional, but it's the same story. You still need to optimize there for the for the content. Mm. Get more links to, to power to power that uh, that rank, you know, rankings and for the uh, brand uh, queries uh, that come to your site, it's also important to rank among the top. Maybe there are the situations when people are not searching ex exactly for your brand; mm -hmm. they're searching for some particular product on your brand, and that yeah. match is not the first, and you're losing visitors there Ooh. if. Uh, You've just given me a really good idea that I'm going to keep to myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'll share it with you, but I've got to work on it yet, because it's probably going to be really stupid if I say it now. Um, but is that the same as the sales funnel? Is is organizing your content strategy according to intent the same thing as organizing it according to the sales funnel? You can do that, but I wouldn't focus only purely on uh, purely on this uh, no sorry what I mean is the sales funnel is this yeah. information then go and then do uh, would that be exactly the same or the sales funnel is more complica complicated it's a different beast I think, the sales different funnel. beast thank you yeah. yeah it's a different process there on the sales funnel okay the differences the differences uh, between the informations uh, so people when they are coming to do an action maybe they start a trial maybe they buy a product mm -hmm. But uh, maybe the sales funnel means that they buy a trial, then they need to continue. You need to help them continue. Maybe they need to upgrade. So that it's okay, a yeah. story there. You, well, you, perspective. Sorry, what I just heard there is you've got multiple dues. Yeah, yeah. By the person who has yeah. signed up for the trial and yeah. signed up for it. And then, it depends then, on the persona, what type of you. For, for example, for us, if a small business comes, it's one kind of a discussion. Hmm. If an agency comes, it's different. Sorry. If a brand comes with SEO professionals, it's again a different a different discussion, a different perspective. The onboarding should be a bit different also. So you can provide to that persona the uh, best value of the product. So okay, there yeah, are okay. challenges, yeah. Yeah, okay. And moving over to brand mentions, because yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that was yeah, part of what yeah, you just yeah, made yeah, me yeah, think of, because yeah. I love brand yeah, yeah. syrups. And, okay, um, okay. Uh, you, you do brand mention collection. Do yeah. you do brand and product mention? Collection. So you practically track their keywords, and when you track keywords, those keywords can be a brand, can be a topic, can be a product. Okay. So you can track anything and get notifications and record the entire history for that particular keyword. So you mm -hmm. will see the evolution of the mentions for your brand, your competitors, for uh, a topic that you're mm -hmm. uh, interested in, uh, for a product, yeah. and uh, all this stuff. You and know? do you bring it into any kind of metric that, that people can compare over time, yeah. other than just kind of your ranking for? Yes, there is a performance metric. Okay, which brilliant. Tells, which tells you how performance that piece of mesh and that particular mesh is. Uh, so uh, we taking into calculation the number of shares and mm. the, uh, the importance, the performance of the domain, the mm. page where this this mesh has appeared. And we compute them into uh, this mentioned performance score, which allows you to uh, easily look on the mentions. If you got the mentions on in your post, for, yep. for, for example, it's more important than the mention, whatever uh, blog mm -hmm. uh, or whatever. So you can easily see see that information. More mm -hmm. than that, you can filter on a lot of stuff there. So sentiment also okay. is uh, identified. Yeah, sentiment very yeah. important. Can yeah. I ask you a completely impossible question? So, okay. <laughs> How much? I'll give you a completely impossible answer. <laughs> There are masses of mentions. The web is enormous. Yeah. How much are you missing? Because, I mean, SEMrush, for example, I, I've got a brand mention okay. thing, and it took them three months to find a mention that I thought would have been pretty easy to find. How much do you think you're missing? You find it or they found it? No, they found it. I, I, okay, I was... So they found it after three months? Yeah. Okay, that was the problem. Actually, that's why I started brand mentions. Ah, because okay. most of the tools... And the sorry, market, SEMrush. 
most of the tools on the market didn't uh, didn't report uh, and don't report the mansions uh, uh, when they are appearing. And yeah. Maybe they are reporting mansions uh, that appeared in the past. So that was why I started uh, the okay. concept of, uh, of brand mansions. Because I was practically tracking Cognitive SEO and couldn't get the tool to actually send me the mansions. I was appearing in a blog, in a newspaper or whatever in social media and I was getting that mansion maybe after two weeks, even mm. though I was noticing yeah. that, 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 that and delay. You're yeah. getting them much faster. That's what we are uh, aiming for, and that's why I think we are achieving, because we are also running a crawler, and we also use several data sources. So we merge all this all this okay. data, and we uh, provide a more quality feed. So we take a lot of data, and we also uh, throw, throw away the junk mentions, because there is duplicate content on the web yeah. and a lot of stuff. There. Oh, is that? I hadn't yeah. noticed. <laughs> Sorry, that, was, that, that, was, that was... But you wouldn't imagine that there are people that would want to see all that duplicate. Oh, really? Content. Okay. Yeah, and we added that feature in then brand mansions that would allow you to see all the mansions. That and people use content. it when they first sign up and then stop after about a week because it gets so boring. Yeah, probably. <laughs> they don't receive the mansions in there saying, why am I not receiving them? Because you're not mansion. <laughs> Very good yeah. answer. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, that's uh, it's a ch it's challenging to get all of this stuff uh, together and to filter it and to curate it practically yeah. automatic automatically and algorithmically to be able to provide uh, transmissions. Yeah. Also, another thing that we are solving there is with uh, uh, generic brands, even brand mansions. It's a generic brand name or orange. Yeah. Okay. Or, yeah. Oh, oh, how do you do that? Context. So, so we, we uh, do that by allowing you to enter uh, keywords that may represent the brand. So if Brilliant. I tra tra tracking Apple, for example, I would add keywords that uh, um, are related to Apple, iPhone, iPad, MacBook, yeah. uh, computer, whatever. And then you check the content of the page yeah. and you say, this is the Apple, the fruit, because yeah. it's got... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then which is also, context yeah. clouds. Yeah. And Bill then that's the, the first part, and then you have negative keywords that you can add, okay. and uh, yeah, multiple other things that. Uh, can I make a point? Yeah. You suddenly sound like a genius. Ah, come on. <laughs> I'm so charming, but no, no, I'm I'm really, really, really excited and impressed, okay. and I want to go and have a look at this because it's incredibly okay. interesting. Okay. Okay, um, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. SEO is a o. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Muito <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That was lovely. That, you see, it was worth waiting yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually just down. I think it went okay. I think it was fucking brilliant. I'm sorry, I, I'm not allowed to swear, am I? <laughs> it was really cool. It was really good, yeah. Okay. And do you have an API for your brand mansion yeah. thing? Can I borrow it? Just to have a little play. We are actually practically just finishing up. We have the internal API and we are preparing the external API. And we are having yeah, people that we are want, who want to use Okay. Because what I've been doing is uh, pinging Google uh, with brand queries. queries. Google Alerts, practically. Is, uh, they have no, no, I ping it and I, 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 I grab the... Oh. It's fire alarm. Oh, no, it... Everyone. I, I grab the sir. Yeah, uh, 10,000 people. just gone out for lunch. There's loads and loads of people. Yeah. You think so, but still in the building, like there are so many of them. But maybe six times. <laughs> well, they've stopped now, so we don't have to go anywhere. And if we, yeah. if we there's yeah, a window there, we can jump yeah, out yeah, of there. Yeah, yeah. Three floors is fine. You're pretty tall. I'll stand on your shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you jump, jump out, yeah, I'll stand yeah, on your yeah, shoulders. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, we can start. We're live? Live. Yeah. SEO is AEO. Welcome to the show, Chris Liversid. <laughs> what a lovely intro, thank you. I was very careful with the last part of the night because I got it wrong just before. Everyone we went does, live. everyone does. But fantastic, perfect. Thank you. Are you from Edinburgh? I'm actually from Aberdeen, but I live in Edinburgh. Yeah. But your accent is very, very light. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, is that a compliment? <laughs> yeah, well, it depends. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, thick Doric uh, in, in in Aberdeen, and uh, okay. I seem to have escaped most of it. And you say that you've still got your very old floppy disk from yes. circa 2000, 1998? Yeah, before. just the turn of the millennium, yeah. So uh, I... And what's it, on it? What's on your floppy disk? I, I have... Two websites on one, and I have some others which I could only fit one website on each floppy. Yeah. Okay. Is that the kind of thing you bury in the garden for the? Oh no, you say <laughs> space for the agent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and you would take commissions by basically reading newspapers if you remember those, uh, and you would get uh, uh, adverts pushed out by big companies saying, you know, can anyone build a website? You know, we're, we're we need one. Okay. Um, so it was back in those days. Yeah. I would take it on a floppy disk, uh, <laughs> and I would walk into the offices, and no one would have the internet. They'd say, oh, we want a website, but, you know, we don't know how people see it. So you would waggle your floppy disk at them? I would f plug it in, and I would show them, and they'd say, that looks great. How much is that? <laughs> oh, brilliant. And it cost a fortune. Oh, of time. course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> great stuff. And, and you, you, you're a big fan of the fact that we're coming back to all this old technology. I am. You mentioned... Um, can't remember what it is you mentioned. Well, um, oh, sprite sheets. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so mobile uh, speed optimization. So uh, actually, Google did a tech uh, uh, sort of speech uh, about four years ago, and they set out how their objective was technically sub one second on mobile for okay. first not page doing render. Very well, aren't they? No one's doing that. <laughs> so the first render, so the bit on your phone that you can see that yeah. uh, that you don't have to scroll, that has got to be sub one second. And that's got to be on 3G. And in 3G, you've only got 14 kilobytes before the tower needs another connection. So unless, really? yeah, yeah, that's designed in to stop mobile reception crashing when too much data comes in. So 3G towers, 14 kilobytes, that's your limit. So we're back to those really, really awful yeah. modems. Yes. We're actually even worse. Yes. Sorry, interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was developing Flash content in 1998. Right, yes. Yeah. And, and we had that incredibly... The most important thing was how you streamed it. We were, we, yes. were, we were very careful about streaming it over time. Yes. And the thing, the trick was to get them something to do yep. within the first yep, yep. 14K. So and they, they would notice in the yeah. background. And then, oh, it was for kids' games. So they would be playing with something. You'd show them something waving around like that. Yeah. And they'd be occupied with that while you loaded all the rest yeah, of the stuff. There you, know. you go. Same deal. And if you think so why about can't it, we just get flashback. Well, <laughs> because because it's a nightmare. Oh, <laughs> that's I that's it. why. I loved it. It's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It is. It is. HTML5 for the win. I mean, surely oh, come on, yeah, these yeah, days. Yeah. Um, but HTML5, you do have a problem with that streaming. And the flash allowed you, you to spread it over time. And it, was, it was it was incredibly effective. Yeah, I mean, we did a proof of concept concept on the fourteen kilobyte thing. So you oh, would. Right. Basically, to, to, to hit that, if you want to have a website that works, you have to break best practice. So you can't use uh, external files for CSS and JavaScript for that initial render. You've got to inline it, which, have, oh. which is against best practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you've got to keep your HTML as light as you can. So Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. So, so we're coming back to the challenge. Coming right, right the way the back. Beginning. Yeah. Uh, and so basically that first second is 14K. Your whole site has to. Whole what site. You're them has render to render that, that first bit of your phone. But that changes completely the way I would develop a web page. Yeah. Which yeah. is brilliant. Mm. Another question. On 4G, what's yeah. that figure? Oh, as high as you like. It's much, much, much higher. Oh, so okay. 4G is designed to handle much, much higher uh, bandwidths of data. So they don't okay. have the 14 kilobyte cap. All right. So I won't bother redoing it. Well, we say that, but Google, is, Google that, yes. tests <laughs> and its algorithm is, is based on the 3G performance. How, how much longer for that? Well... That's a good question. Uh, yeah. No one knows. Ah, no one okay. knows. Until we hear from the mothership, we, you know, we have to assume it's going to carry on for a couple of years. I would assume. So in the next couple of years, I need to do the 14K trick. We're going to call you it should have done now. that two years ago, in my Sorry. view. And but for the next two years, I think that's still valid. Where were you two valid. years ago in my land? <laughs> I, I was being paid by enterprise businesses to <laughs> give them this advice. There are problems, of course. So you can't really do e-commerce in that function, right? You can't show stock availability. 
you know, if you're trying to do 14 kilobyte. Mm. But trends like static sites, uh, and you can execute e-coms on static sites, they, they play absolutely into that space. So you get a fantastic render time, mm. you get low, low uh, latency, it's, it's, it's like it was back in the 90s and the early noughties. And sprites, to come back to yeah. that, so obviously you, know, you want to minimize the number of requests in, uh, so if you can use a sprite and do all of your image, yeah. Uh, apart from you know uh, photos etc., then that's what you should do. Well, well no, it's, so so nineties web design is yeah. coming back to real. No, the, the old people yeah. like you and me yeah. have got a big advantage of uh, over the twenty five year olds who are like yeah. six or seven at that time, <laughs> and they were probably playing on my kids. Don't, side. don't say that. It's, it's it's horrifying, isn't it? But yes, oh, it's great. you're right. <laughs> oh, I feel I feel like the advantage of being old. There are yeah. very few. Yeah, that's one. But I think what's interesting about that is the fundamentals. So I, essentially, I've been you know in websites for twenty years and and in digital marketing for over a decade, a decade oh. and a half maybe. And we come back to fundamentals again and again. So it's about the technical platform. It's about your ability to to execute that with the lightest possible load, with the minimum possible resource requirement oh. and that that underpins all your performance you know we executed for for ee ee our client of 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 qc my company ee qc you're getting right ee qc yeah. yeah they came on board as t mobile um they've been with us nine and three quarter years we're 10 years old so they're going to join uh, uh, working with us for a decade yeah. this year we won bt group last year so who bought ee so they're staying with us ee qc bt exactly can we uh, keep going with this it's about uh, really nice the concept. only the only follow-on i have to that is the the we spent in the middle of 2015 16 we spent two years managing the migration. You remember they went to everything everywhere. Do you remember that brief period? There was about no, a year. No, I live in France. So. Okay. Oh well, <laughs> it was a delight in the yeah. UK. I'll tell you that. Everything everywhere. Everything everywhere. There was actually nothing nowhere. And they shortened it to EE because they realised that no one, yeah. no one could remember everything everywhere. So it was a two-year migration. At the end of that process, we'd increased the organic search by sixty-four million pounds. Oh. So tech, not sexy. Not glamorous, not shiny, but people sat in the sprint meeting saying, this is worth X to you. Don't take it off the sprint list. It's going to drive this revenue. Do that for two years and you can deliver 64 million pounds of revenue. Given that Sprint is a telecom operator, isn't it a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> having Sprint meetings at BT? That's a good question. Yeah, I hadn't that's, considered that. There's a brand of opportunity there, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe they have to license it. Yeah, so it's, I mean, the, 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 the idea that we need to optimize for this 14K thing, back, back yeah. to that, sorry, it's really caught, yeah. my, caught my attention and my interest. It's yeah. nothing to do with the, the talk you were giving earlier on. Mm. Uh, I mean, for the next two years, we're developing this 14K, which means breaking all best practices. Yeah, that's right. And in a couple of years, 4G is going to be pretty much universal in yeah. in the Western world. What about places like India or, or are yeah. they already 4G? I don't well, know. No, they're not. And that's part of the reason why Google is saying, look, you've got to hit this test against the 3G. And it's all in their documentation. You know, it's not a grand secret. Oh, well, you've read it. Yeah, yeah. A bit like Bill Slowski reading patents. Exactly. You read Google documentation. I always have done, always will do. <laughs> Bill Slowski is is a, a pioneer. You know, I've been he's, reading him since day one. And, uh, day one of what? His day, one, day, his day one. one, his day one, and I started to realize that the patents are where the, the, the good juice is, yeah. you know. And this stuff about uh, 14 kilobytes, you know, Google did presentations on this. They go, they do hardcore development presentations, mm. and they say, this is what we want you to achieve. This is how we are measuring this stuff. Yeah. So it's out there. It's been out there for uh, three, four years, you know. So the, the I, most people don't know. Most people don't talk about it. I uh, think why not? Why not? Why not? It's not sexy. Oh. It's not sexy. Sorry, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking you know, it's really sexy. Exciting. Sexy is voice search, okay? Okay. Okay, how much voice search in reality, how much revenue does that drive for companies? None. None is the answer. Or very little. Yeah, a, a less than a percent. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that will change over time. And then you ask yourself, okay, well, how do I optimize for voice search? Well, you optimize by making sure that you've got uh, markup correct so yeah. that you're going to get all of the, the great um, rich snippet action because yeah. those those are pulled in at high rate. We were talking and, about that earlier on, not you and me, yeah you need to be good on mobile. And so you need fast mobile render speed. So it's not sexy, but it drives performance in all these sexy spaces that people and, care about. And the whole thing about amps, I mean, bring, yeah. it, bring amp into that 14K question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the 14K trick question, I would have to... Yeah. Go on, how does it apply? How, how do you leverage that? For me, amp is something you do when you give up. Really? Yeah. Go on, why? Well, you can... Well, you, sorry, when you rubbish, <laughs> you do amp. Yeah, oh. that, that's my view. Okay, that's me then. 
Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> Anna, it's a shame that you've given up. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to not giving up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Start again. So, look, I mean, there is an argument to say you can have AMP as a strategy. If you want to have extra listings for particular mm. terms, you use AMP, you, you play that along. Like, but, 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 yeah, but the carousel AMP will replace your, your canonicalized linked URL. Yeah. So, what you're missing out on is control. You lose control. And also, you lose an ability within your business to gain momentum, to improve your performance, which is going to help all your SEO. Mm. So, why give up? Okay, so you're saying uh, progressive or pro blah, responsive sites. Yeah. Or even progressive. What about PWI? Yeah, progressive is fine. I mean, progressive is so fine. The ideal is PWA, yeah. not with AMP, because that, that's PWAMP, which exactly. I love. Exactly. PWA with the 14K trick, yeah. or the 14K yeah. limit, or whatever. That's the gold standard. That's Ooh. what you go for. So go for that. AMP for me is is a crutch. Um, and the problem with crutches is, it, I mean, I, most of my clients are big enterprise businesses, yeah. okay? People like Tesco, BT Group, all these guys. Yeah. And you need a business case to get anyone to lift a finger. And that's just the, the way it is in, in enterprise yeah. SEO. Um, and I've always worked in that space. And for me, revenue is always the metric that people care about that moves the needle. You know, think back to that EE example, 65 yeah. million pounds organic it uplift. It was 64 earlier on. 64.5. So I go either ah, way, round so up, I, round I, down. I am actually listening. <laughs> round up, round down. You know, so that, I change my, my When uh, you get my ambitious. Interest. You round up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the point is, they they care about revenue, and the and the problem with AMP is you're you're basically saying, oh, we've solved this problem using AMP, and you've mm. you've had to get it, you've had to do some work to do integration, you, you know. So you your business has gone and committed and executed AMP. So when you turn around and say, oh, we need faster mobile performance, say, well, haven't we got AMP? Mm. And you lose your ability to 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 kind of compete on that because. The decision makers are not going to understand the distinction between yes, I'm capturing some AMP traffic, and and that's got decent volume depending on the the industry you're in, but I'm going to improve all my organic performance by improving page speed, and they just don't understand that distinction. Google went to a mobile first algorithm, so mm -hmm. everything is all about mobile. Every optimization is all about mobile. You know, I, I, I'm like you. I've been around the industry long enough to know. You know, there was there was about a five year period where everyone in every conference was talking about how next year is the year of mobile. Next year is yeah. the year of mobile. <laughs> next year, it's the year of mobile. Well, and well, then suddenly, next, yeah. two years ago was the year of mobile. Right. You know, it just sort of switched like that, right? And Yeah, and Simon Cox was talking about how slow all these things are to actually come, yes. come into being from the moment Google says, yeah. this is going to be happening. And patience. And Google knows that, right? That's why they give these kind of technical talks. They say, you've got to get your shit ready. They prepare us three years in yeah. advance. Yeah. And then they say, no excuses. You know, we, we told you, right? Yeah, so it was the same with Big Daddy back in 2005. So the Big Daddy update where Google started to do all of this uh, page speed optimization for desktop mm. went back when they didn't really have good infrastructure and it was a big infrastructure update and yeah. all packaged in there was we have a dial now in the algorithm that says the better your page speed, the, the better you're going to perform. And we're going to put it really low. 2005, it would have been a really big kind of button that they did. Big, turned. big One button. Of those yeah, yeah. I would like to imagine that back then, Matt Cutts had a big red button on his <laughs> desk. He would just hit it with his fist. <laughs> Bang! Okay, there we go. And so they set the dial very low. I cut into And they company. turn it up, and they turn it up, and they turn it up. And it's because they, you know, a lot of these big companies are also advertising yeah. with Google. They need to kind of yeah. Give them warning, and the impact for them of bad performance is I've got to pay more and paid. Yeah. You know, I have to be visible better. So there's a direct financial cost. There's businesses Brilliant. they understand that relationship. Yeah. So, okay. so we're here again. It's 2005 they're again. They're turning that dial up again. They're it, turning it's the dial like up. a torture chamber. You can yeah. imagine us being on the rack That's being it. stretched out bit by bit. And what we don't know is how much that wheel is going to get turned on that rack. So we don't know when they're going to just go, guys, it's been two years. Yeah. It's been three years. Now, you know, in fact, it was three years with desktop. So next year would be into year three of when Google said, you've got to sort this stuff out, guys. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Another question. Okay. JavaScript yes. and all of that, because you've got your 14K yeah. limit, whatever mm -hmm. it is. You've done your inline CSS. Yeah. What do you do with your super duper inline jQuery? Ja inline JavaScript. Yeah, but what about jQuery? Oh, ditch it. Oh, ditch it. Why what do about you, Angular JS? Why do you need a framework to do ninety percent of the things you do in JavaScript? In that fourteen K rubbish at coding. In that fourteen K that I talked <laughs> about, we executed it. We wrote inline JavaScript. You 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 need maybe twelve lines and you can do some basic transformation stuff. 
okay. That's all, all okay. Well, can, can you can you can you put that inline stuff in with the inline CSS, the inline yeah. JavaScript, yeah, yeah. and then load jQuery after and put some yes, bells and whistles. Yes, you can do that. You yeah. do your own load, load me JavaScript, lazy load, load, load of, of JavaScript, yeah. whatever that's called in JavaScript. Absolutely. I'm rubbish at it. Then start doing the fancy bells and whistles with exactly, which is ooh, ooh. <laughs> a bit like my my, my first <laughs> trick. Yeah, okay. It was, it was put the minimum in there. Yes. Get, get them engaged within that first second with me, 14K. Yeah. Then pull in the bells and whistles Lazy while they're it. playing around with whatever it is you're giving them to play around with to start with. You're right, yeah. Brilliant. It's, it's exactly that. Back to 1998. Same strategies. Flash won't come back despite my <laughs> great desire for that. <laughs> yeah. But, but we can we can do the same trick with inline CSS, inline concept. JavaScript, unload the yeah. JavaScript, jQuery. I can use Jerry, jQuery then and be very... Yeah, you can. I mean, I would still say, come on, why can't you write your own? Because I'm rubbish. I've told you about three times. I'm really rubbish at it. <laughs> JavaScript is, is a horrible thing for me to write. It's PHP just, is terribly easy because it doesn't just, mind a bit It's bad. just coding. I mean, PHP is that messy code where, yeah. you know, you can make mistakes. You can do it not quite right. Yeah. It still functions. Suits me fine. Yeah. <laughs> so what well, you're saying is it. actually learn, learn, learn the business. Yeah, exactly. And so there's another there's another area. So I've, I've always been interested in this idea, this connection between performance, performance technical performance, and, uh, and, and business performance. Okay. So at the enterprise, scale that's what we care about and in, in QC we've had an R&D department for 10 years QC R&D EEBT yeah, there we go yeah, all yeah. those acronyms I'm, I'm, I'm loving it I, know, I mean that's what our industry is all about isn't it um, <laughs> we love an acronym EAT um, sorry I'm, I'm getting over excited yeah. yeah so what I like about what I like about having R&D and, and, and connecting development to, to this industry our marketplace is you can innovate very quickly you can iterate very quickly and you can have impact directly on your clients clients or if you're if you're in-house you know for your own site um, we do a piece at the moment around attribution okay mm -hmm. so we we brought to market a product it's it's outside of just SEO but the purpose of it initially was how is SEO affecting store footfall you know mm -hmm. so B&Q asked us that question uh, and we said well have you used Google's attribution tool yeah we have it's yeah. expletive didn't get me what I want um, and the reason for that is, long story short, cleaning up the data going into your attribution model is yeah. the key. So attribution is a solved problem. Attribution is a statistical question. Mm. It is, you know, a Markov chain. You just share value across different touch points as someone comes in and converts, and that's it, instead of last click, which is where everyone is. Mm. Now, the thing about attribution is when you're doing your key phrase strategies for organic search mm. or for paid, you're, you're being driven towards last click terms. You know, those yeah. are the terms that have volume and they're the terms that have high bids against them. It's very competitive. It's a saturated channel. It's a saturated stage of the customer conversion path. But if you can understand attribution, <coughs> you can develop key phrase strategies that are earlier in that customer funnel. Yeah. So Avinash Kaushik, you know, he, he helped create... Mm -hmm. Avinash Kaushik. All right. He helped like create Google Analytics back in the day. He's a consultant. Which was built on Urchin, which yes. is another old technology yes. that you and I remember. Oh, yes. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that very well. When it was one of many. Yes. Then Google bought it and we said, ah, okay, okay there you go, we're it. all going to use Urchin now. <laughs> um, just like AdWords was, you know, one of many, yeah. you know. Um, but the but the reason why I talk about that is just because key phrase strategies for me and, and, and Brighton SEO is, you know, an incredible event. There's lots of really interesting theory. There's lots of good practical examples out there. And, and the, but the wall that I think gets hit a lot is from a key phrase strategy perspective, how do you really correctly capture new customers? Mm. And there's some kind of soft metrics you can use. You can say, oh, well, you know, informational content. Informational content is usually earlier. So I'll go after that. Yeah. Um, but the problem you've got in a big, big enterprise is, well, you know, what's my last click measurement on that? Well, it's nearly zero. So I'm not convinced that those terms are adding any value for yeah. me. And you might be able to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're increasing brand search volume. And your the, the counterpoint will always be, yeah, but we're, you know, we did TV or we did X, Y, Z that you don't have sight on. And mm. that influences brands. So, so attribution for me is the other part of the future of, of search search whether it's organic or paid and yeah. bringing people together or bringing those 
sessions together in a way uh, that correctly reflects how people engage with your product or your business or your yeah. brand. I think it gets away. We were talking yep. about it very briefly earlier on, and yeah. you said uh, mapping SEO to all well, in, attribution to yes. all the channels. And I said, what, all five? And you <laughs> went, no, 30, 40, 50, 100. Everything. Offline, yeah. TV, yeah. print, yeah. keep going, keep going, nice lint. Yeah, so so TV and radio is a classic one, right? Yeah. So TV, radio, the data you get from that is you get spend and you get planners. So oh. when that spend was used, you get sometimes, and you know you should always ask for this if you're not getting it, you get it by channel as well. Oh. So the way that we approached attribution, we created machine learning models. We used PhD studies three years ago, developed that into a, a, t a software stack and a, and a product that, that's, that's enterprise ready. Um, we compared that to, to Google's offering yep. for, uh, for a client of ours. Um, we had 300% more data available for attribution, mm -hmm. like absolute standout. We have a patent on that process. And it means that we can we use... So which Bill Slavsky will be reading. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm going to get to yeah, it yeah, and yeah. ask him what he thinks Tell him, tell him please, that I've got a year before it comes out. So, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the reason why I tell all, all of that story is just it helps us understand that... You know, people people go across those different marketing channels, and the way that the machine learning model works is it just looks at events and probabilistically, how likely is it that that event, you on a bus going past an out, an out of home poster, then jumping on your mobile and going onto a site, how likely is it that that's you, and that's also you later on yeah. at work on your desktop. And how likely is it X, Y, and Z? And you can predict that to the same level of statistical certainty as scientists use to prove the Higgs boson. Okay, but, but that, what, what's your training data? Yeah, so we take two, that's two years. That's my question. You're going, great question. Oh, two, thank you. Two, I'm, yeah. I'm terribly pleased with yeah. myself. <laughs> so you connect in, use a service account, you connect in, you get the raw click stream for yeah. all the digital data. That's your kind of cornerstone. Yeah. Two years of that data, you find, using the machine learning model, customers moving through that data. You then add in other data sources, and you join as those events cross over. So you go, OK, that's that person there. Here they are coming in. And you push that data back into the other data sources. So okay. it's all event-based. It's all statistical-based. It's all built from the ground up. You don't need to ingest in any customer data. You can match it over to customer data. You take a hashed ID, and you can connect into the, the CMS, and mm. you, you know you, you can you can enrich your data. Um, but but the reason why that's that's interesting is every time we've done it, we found that search is way undervalued. So paid search, really? yeah. So for a hundred million pound turnover uh, client, we found that they were underestimating paid search value by thirteen million pounds a year. They were wrong in terms of their attribution model mm. by over fifty million in terms of where the revenue is coming from. So, so what more, kind of percentage is that? <laughs> well, that is their hundred million turnover. So oh, right, sorry, it was sorry, more than fifty percent wrong. Very stupid question. More yeah. than fifty percent wrong. <laughs> Crumbs. Yeah. I almost said a very And we see that again and again and again and again. So okay, brilliant. At attribution is one of those things. Because, sorry, coming back to yeah, old yeah, sorry. people's I'm, stories. I'm passionate no, 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 no. So but coming back to old people's stories, yeah. I remember when the banners came out and yes. we were getting 2% click rate. And yeah. we shot ourselves in the foot because we were going 2% click rate and we sold it on what sold it. Was like, yeah. And people got bored of banners and stopped clicking. And all of a sudden, all the value of what we were saying. Yep. And we were saying we can measure the, the, yes. the, the billboards, the TV, and the radio, and the magazines. You know, We'll imagine that if one magazine is sold, 10 people read it in the doctor's yeah. office. And it's all completely made up. Or yes, more exactly. Or made up. And we're saying we can measure, we can measure. And then all of a sudden we've got this situation yeah. where we were measuring too well and people go, well, there's no value because there's no click. We were, and we you're were, saying we can now measure and we can bring these two together, exactly. together and actually use this predictive modeling for this offline stuff, which was yes. junk science in my opinion. Yes. Turn yeah. it into a real science, map it to what we've got and valorize the work that we're actually doing in SEO and SEA. Yeah, exactly. So we were... So I got over it. We were, we were, yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, we were saying with more confidence than we actually had that, that these numbers, these these data points we were giving back were accurate. And they weren't. The, yeah. the technology was not there. You couldn't do large scale data processing in the cloud. You know, you couldn't be someone other than a big technology company yeah. and come and solve a problem like that. We can because we live in the cloud today, right? Yeah. We deploy the whole stack on other on, on other cloud instances. Yeah. You ramp up as as required as the data comes in. So you don't need to, you know, invest 10 million pounds in a stack so you can offer something to everyone you don't need to do that you could be agile and launch tomorrow brilliant stuff yeah so and what's nice is but, with, sorry, can, can, yeah just, I'll, I'll come back to you what's nice yeah, I, just yeah. something i can't stop would it be reasonable to assume that if you're 
given client was underestimated by 50%, let's say, yeah. uh, the value of his organic and his yes. SEO, or SEO, yeah. SEO tra- could I say that to my client? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if they've got offline offerings as well, if they don't yeah. have offline offerings, I can't. And what you'll find, yeah, you, you, even if they aren't doing offline, you'll still find there's, there's huge difference in terms of that. When you look at email, email is is heavily undervalued typically. Really? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, <laughs> into our analytics, you, you look at... Yeah, but analytics is not cleaning the data. So... Ah. This this uh, this data. study that we did exactly that it's a mess. Yeah, the way that the analytics platforms kind of handle that is sessions break. They don't they don't do very good mm. kind of cross device. They're not they're not. Oh, but you do do cross device. Yeah, we do, and because we mm. use two years of historic data, so you can you're finding those people on all devices, and you're finding them in a much much higher level of accuracy as a result. Okay. It's all driven by a machine learning model and it spits out the answers. It's what machine learning is built for. You know, yeah. it's exactly that kind of problem, right? Yeah, yeah. Make connections that you cannot understand or you yeah. cannot compute or create an algorithm for. Yeah. So because because we do that, we, we see even in digital the search, particularly particularly paid, mm-hmm. particularly paid uh, spent in generics. Yeah. So for one of our clients we found that they they were undervaluing paid generics by about half. They were they were launching yeah. as a brand. They were operating in in fifteen different countries. They were launching in America. Very very well known brand in the UK. Launching, mm-hmm. launching in America. Just started investing money. The more they spent, the worse their revenue was from paid search. They couldn't work it out. Okay. We reattributed the data, and the revenue was actually going up. So the more they were spending in generics, the more revenue they were making. But it was going down because because all of that revenue was being attributed to direct. It was being classified mm-hmm. into this okay. bucket. Where, the rubbish bucket. Yeah, the rubbish bucket. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Where all hope goes, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, as soon as you remove it from direct and bring it back into the correct channel, it, it's transformational. And if you bring that data into your key phrases, then you can line up your your paid search strategies and your priorities there, actual revenues, real CPA targets. And you can line that up against organic search, and you have. I, I talk about it. I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, it uh, later on today. I, I talk about the key phrases being the foreign key. Mm. It's you know in databases, foreign keys are ways you join different data sets. Yeah. So key phrases really are the foreign key. And if you bring attributed data into that mix, it gives you complete accuracy about the full customer journey. And then you can approach marketing like traditional marketing, like people did before digital came along. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and, and so we're coming back to the nineties yes. again. Wait, wait, and, and this is this is the whole thing with with <coughs> with tables and lists. And I mean, this is my yeah. simple examples and, and animated gifs. Yes. Uh, or gifs or whatever. Or gifs. Called. Yeah, uh, I'm like, I'm a gif guy. Yeah. I'm a gif guy. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, all, all these things that we'd forgotten and thrown away, and 14k trick, yeah. and uh, writing proper content and PR instead of link building, yeah. and and now saying attribution models and uh, understanding the traditional or going, coming back to the yeah. traditional way of attributing. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. So, so we're coming back to the nineties again. So what happens is with with really good attributed data is you can stop thinking about the data. You're getting good revenue performance back, mm. so you can kind of get back into the world of saying, you know what, I need to do really good creative. I can measure it. Yeah. I can measure. You know, I don't have to say this is a brand exercise. I can actually say that well, the brand will be measured correctly and attributed into my results, so I can see how much revenue this is generating. Okay. So, so you, you can. I mean, you, you can also. I mean, sorry, isolate yeah. the brand and say yes. how how powerful is my brand? Yes. In absolutely. terms of acquirement. Or y- yeah, you can you can put value on it. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And, and this is an enterprise level product that, Correct. for people like BT and Tesco, and, uh, people like that. Q and A and no B and A and B Q. B Q. B Q. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody like me can. As long use as it. they've got two letters in their name, <laughs> then it's applicable. But yeah. somebody like me can't use it. Um, you need enough data. Oh, which I don't. So you need about a million rows of data a day minimum if you want to get a model working, and you need a decent amount of history. Yeah. And you need some hard cash to actually pay for the service. Yeah, you. you, That is a given. (laughs) Yeah. You don't do it for free by any chance. No, no, no. You got to value your time. You got to value your product. (laughs) Brilliant Um, stuff. That was. Really, 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 really passionately interesting. Okay, good. I'm glad. SEO is <laughs> AEO. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Can we do the ending again? Yeah. I'm going to split that into two and do two different programs. Sure. SEO is AEO. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>